of this hearing. Good morning, everybody. It's February 11th, 2020, and I'm calling to order the uh, meeting of the Story County Board of Supervisors, and I'd ask you to join us, if you'd like, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, next would be adoption of today's agenda, and I would um, entertain a motion for, to approve the agenda. I so move as presented. Right. Second. Olson? Aye. Heddens? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Agenda is adopted. Next, we have public comment number one. This comment period is for the public to address topics on today's agenda. If any members of the public would like to speak briefly, um, please come to the microphone. Seeing nobody, move to the microphone. I will close public comment number one. Next on the agenda is recognition of Story County 2019 Years of Service Awards. And we had our recognition uh, breakfast uh, last uh, week, which was a, a success, a very good event. But for those of you who weren't there and for the public, I will um, read the list now of the employees that we recognized um, at our uh, breakfast for years of service. 35 years, Brent Baldiff, Assessor's Office, 30 years, Dina McKenna, Sheriff's Office, 25 years, Loretta Smith, Sheriff's Office, and Constant Torsdahl, Sheriff's Office, 20 years, John Asmussen, Sheriff's Office, Tammy Gardner, Assessor's Office, Tammy Lehman, Treasurer's Office, Brad McLean, Veterans Affairs, 15 years, Clark Blau, Sheriff's Office, Michelle Belisle, Auditor's Office, congratulations, Lucy Martin, Auditor's Office, Wayne Shikarath, Auditor's Office, 10 years, Tiffany Assessor's Office. Assessor's Office. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Ten years, Tiffany Meredith, Attorney's Office. Nicholas Brasino, Sheriff's Office. Christopher Erickson, Secondary Roads. Bo Hoppy, I think it's Hoppy, Conservation. Tyler Sparks, Secondary Roads. David Swanson, Assessor's Office. Five years, Justin Braylon, Secondary Roads. Deacon Garvey, Assessor's Office. Kelly Ruther, Facilities Management, Matthew Bartis, Sheriff's Office, Rebecca Beal, Warburton, Conservation, Kyle Besty, Information Technology, Cody Bermeyer, Treasurer's Office, Margie Burkle, Sheriff's Office, Lucas Fielmeyer, Conservation, Jonathan Hol Holster, Attorney's Office, Shauna John Johnson Myers, Attorney's Office, Adam Packer, Sheriff's Office, Erica Place, Conservation, Daniel Simcox, Conservation, and Bree Van Sickle, Secondary Roads. That's a lot of people. I didn't count as I went along, but that's a lot of people. And, and we are very, very blessed to have so many good employees who stay with us and share their expertise with the public as they do their jobs. So, moving on, we have agency reports. Center for Creative Justice, Taylor Schramm. Is it Schramm or Schramm? Schramm. Schramm, okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Taylor. So as Linda said, I'm Taylor Schramm. I'm the director of the Center for Creative Justice, and I'm here to give you our annual report. Um, the Center for Creative Justice is a private nonprofit agency providing community-based correctional supervision services to adult criminal offenders placed on probation by the local judiciary. CCJ has been in existence since 1974, so over 45 years. More than 99% of CCJ's clients are assigned to us by the local judiciary in Story County and Ames. We supervise 70% of the probation cases adjudicated in Story County. CCJ is an important asset for the local court system. If CCJ did not exist, clients would be unsupervised, meaning their activities would not be monitored and there would be no accountability to ensure that the client is making rehabilitative efforts. Today, CCJ's active caseload is around 600 clients and we have five full-time staff members. In 2019, we received 408 cases for supervision, 121 drug cases, 152 OWI cases, and 39 assault cases, including 19 domestic assaults. Many of our clients suffer from substance abuse, mental health, and anger management problems. 
In 2019, we referred 361 clients for substance abuse evaluations, 123 to substance abuse treatment, 44 for mental health evaluations and treatment, and 34 to the Iowa Domestic Abuse Program. We held three anger management classes serving 21 clients. We also continue to partner with the Story County Attorney's Office to facilitate a mental health diversion pretrial program. We supervise one case of that nature at this time. CCJ's probation services are important to our communities. Probation supervision is designed to allow offenders to remain in the community where they receive rehabilitative services and are held accountable to keep others safe from continued criminal conduct. CCJ's probation services are effective. Um, as you are aware from our clear impact scorecard, our two main program measures are our success rate and our recidivism rate. In the 2018-2019 fiscal year, 87% of CCJ's probation clients successfully completed their probation. In 2017, 93% of the clients that successfully completed their probation did not reoffend in the year following their release. We will be completing our updated recidivism study in the next month or so, and we'll be able to report some updated numbers on that very soon. We do face several challenges in meeting our budgetary needs. Cases are assigned to us by the local judiciary. This means that we have no control over the number of cases that we are assigned in any given year. Much of our revenue is generated from the collection of client fees. Revenue projections are complicated by the fluctuation in client numbers and the erratic timing of which clients are able to pay their fees. We also see many clients who suffer from mental health problems. These cases require significantly increased case management time. With caseloads averaging between 115 to 125 cases, these additional time demands severely stretch budgets. We are also seeing an increase in higher charge type or higher risk cases. Again, these cases frequently require increased case management time. In summary, CCJ provides a cost-effective and results-oriented community option for working with adult criminal offenders. Reducing criminal conduct has a widespread impact on the entire community. Fewer tax dollars are expended investigating and prosecuting new crimes, and victimization is reduced. Because our clients are court-ordered to attend appointments, we are able to connect with those members in the community that may not voluntarily seek services. This gives us the opportunity to provide referrals to other agencies and programs. Without their connection to CCJ, these clients would fall through the cracks and not receive any support. Our programming has a positive ripple effect in the community that goes beyond just the clients that we provide services to. Clients who receive treatment and stay sober become more self-sufficient. When clients learn to manage their anger appropriately, obtain and maintain employment, take responsibility for their actions, and manage their finances, um, as well as pay back victims, it impacts the entire community. They become better partners, parents, coworkers, and community members. They remain self-sufficient and can better meet their family's basic needs. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I would now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I have a question for you. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, so one of the things you talked about was the, um, uh, in the ripple effect is, you know, working and stuff. So with Story County in particular, having that low unemployment rate, are you having any challenges connecting them to employment or has that not necessarily been a barrier for you? We haven't necessarily had that problem. Um, we do have a job search center in our lobby, and we try to keep an eye on all the recent job openings. So we've got a ton of resources that I think is helpful to clients a lot. Um, one challenge that we do have is finding employers that are willing to work with people who have a criminal record. And it does just kind of depend on each employer and what those specific charges are. But that is definitely a challenge. So we try to do the best that we can to help clients navigate that process. Um, one exciting thing that I can share is that we are currently partnering with DMAC um, and United Way and City of Ames Chamber of Commerce to put on a welding pilot program for our clients. So that is totally 
funded. Um, they get their tuition, their lab fees, their equipment all paid for, and our clients are able to enroll in a welding class to get their certification, which should also open up more opportunity for an actual mm -hmm. career um, so that they can be more self-sufficient and meet the, the needs of their families. So we are excited about that as well. So, great. Thank you. That was my only question. I just wanted to say congratulations on the continued success rate and recidivism. Thank you. Rate. Thank you so yeah. much. We're pretty proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> I have just a couple questions. Yes. And thanks for your presentation. No problem. Um, you said you use a risk assessment. Do you use the same risk assessment Department of Corrections does, or do you use a different one? So the Department of Corrections updated their risk assessment, and we do not use the same one any longer. Um, however, we do use one that they have used in the past. You use the LSIR? Um, I'm not familiar with that name. I have a copy of it if you'd like to see what it is. Um, I can definitely send that out or give it to you to review. Looks like Iowa risk assessment. Yep, that that's sounds right. Okay, that's Sorry, not I'm not LSIR. familiar that's with okay. the other. Do you, so then you rank your clients according to super on supervision and give services according to the level of risk. That is correct. Yep. So do you know off the top of your head where your clients fall in terms of risk categories? Um, what percentages? Yes. So the most recent that I looked, and this is an estimate, I believe we have about 10% that score intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, probably around, um, I would say, 50 that are um, minimum. And then the remaining 40 would be normal. Okay. And that's a rough estimate. I could definitely pull those numbers and get you exact as well. Okay. And do you know what your client employment rate is right now? I do not. Okay. We have added some program measures to our new scorecard, and so we will be reporting on stats um, as far as when clients maintain employment or mm -hmm. stay in an educational program as well as beginning a new educational program or starting a new job while they're on probation. So we are tracking those stats now. Um, we started in January, good. so we should be reporting on that in the future good. on our scorecard. Because I think that's good to, information to have in terms of some goals with working with employers in the community. Did Definitely. you think of a question? Just kind of a follow-up to your question. Well, you go just ahead. About, I'm assuming that you receive all the notifications from Iowa Works and cha the Chamber, et cetera, about job fairs, et cetera. Yes, right. yes. I figured you guys would be We love working in. with them, so they're great about giving us information and also great about working with our clients when we send them over. So they've been a great asset. And how do you charge your fees? Is it a flat, flat fee or is it a sliding scale? We have a sliding fee scale based on income. Okay. What's the top of that? 575 For a term of probation or? Before the entire term of the probation. Entire term. So it doesn't matter how long their term is. Um, it's just a flat fee. Um, so that ranges from our minimum would be 300 and our highest would be 575 Okay, and do you know about what percentage of your budget you is client fees? Your, uh, your the revenue? majority, yes. Um, I can look that up real quick for you. I've got this. Go ahead. So I'm just trying to find the right year here. Mm -hmm. So over over 50 percent, um, okay. 55 to 60 percent. Okay, that's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I I don't have any other questions, but I'll be interested in the employment rate because I think that we can do more work with employers. Yes, and I think and that is a really great measure of our client success as well, because that's an important thing, being yep. financially stable. So we're excited to be recording that and being able to report on that later this year. For sure. Well, thank you all very right. much. Thank you all. I appreciate okay. your time today. Okay, next we have consideration of minutes, and we have three sets of minutes, uh, regular meeting, February 4th and two other meetings last week, the 4th and the 7th and the latter two meetings were regarding the appointment of a county attorney.
So can we do those all at once? Okay, I would entertain a motion if somebody wants to move to approve all three sets of those minutes. Uh, I move to approve the meeting minutes for both dates on February 4th and February 7th, 2020. I second. Edmonds? Aye. Olson? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Minutes are approved. Next, we have consideration of personnel actions. Again, I would entertain a motion for approval of personnel actions as presented. So moved. Second. Wilson? Aye. Edens? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Approved. Now we'll go to the consent agenda. We have quite a few items on the consent agenda. Are there any that need to be pulled for discussion? None. If not, I would entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda items <laughs> as listed. I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Edens? Aye. Wilson? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Consent is agenda is approved. So now we will go on to public hearing items. The first one is a public hearing to receive comments on two paving projects within Story County. Darren Moon, our county engineer, is with us. Good morning, Darren. Good morning. How are you? Good. All right. What we have here is a two scheduled paving projects for this upcoming summer and these two projects did not meet what they call paving points i'll get to that in a second uh, so that's what the hearing is for the first one is 535th avenue this is paving essentially to get the heart of iowa bike trail on this gravel quarter mile stretch up to e63 because having it mike's tried for many years to get that bike trail through here and it just can't can't do it so we're going to pave this to get them a paved route continue that on the other project is 560th avenue this is something we're working on jointly with the city of huxley um, city paved a portion of it south here i don't know 10 years ago or so um, so they want to get the rest paved about half of it's still in the county so we've uh are funding part of that um, and the city plans to let that the latest maybe sometime in march but before we let either one of them, we have to uh, hold a public hearing because of the paving points. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay. Here's uh, the, there's five categories for paving points. One is the functional classification of the road. Um, if it's a federal aid, farm to market, or local road, you get a certain amount of points for that. Uh, the ADT, the traffic count, is uh, up to 40 points for that and then they see what the closest parallel paved route is. You get points, uh, the further it goes out, the more points you get. And then the percent trucks give you a, a certain points for that, and then you have some bonus points if you have assessments for that paving. Uh, this is the last sheet of our five-year uh, construction program that we turn into the DOT, and it spells out all the new paving jobs. The first two on the list were uh, 13th Street Extension and University Extension. Those both just got barely over the 50 points. You need 50 points or you have to hold a hearing. So the two we're in here for is 560th Avenue. That got 26 points and 535th only got 17. Um, you can still pay them. They just want you to do this extra step of holding the public hearing. So, any questions about that at all? So with that, I'll have you open up the public hearing for public comments. I'll open the public hearing regarding for comments on these paving projects, L-P2773-85 and L-US30 to 73-85. I have no idea what all those numbers mean, but I hope they were necessary for the record, something like that. So the public, I hereby open the public hearing. Are there any comments? Any members of the public who would like to comment, please come to the microphone. Seeing nobody move to the microphone, I will close the public hearing. What's the next step? That is it. That's it. Now we can let the projects. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next, we have consideration of Tedesco Environmental Learning Quarter Phase 3 Final Plans, Specifications, and Form of Contract, and Authorization to Release Bids. So, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And Ryan. Good morning. Good morning.
Yours works, Margaret. <laughs> we don't have good. <laughs> are familiar enough with the with the project. Um, this is the uh, uh, third phase of an anticipated three phases of development of the Tedesco Environmental Learning Corridor. And <clears throat> uh, the first two phases have gone quite well. I try, I, Ryan and I were talking on the drive over here this morning how many years it's been since we've started working on that, and, and uh, neither of us really knew the math in our head, but it's been maybe five years. Five or six, I want to say maybe we, Since we began this process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when early on in the development of the project that um, the Conservation Board and the, the Board of Supervisors at that point was very concerned that we, in order to do the, uh, the corridor, that we leverage um, a trail connectivity away from um, or to R38 from Tedesco, mm -hmm. and um, and so this is this was uh, this is bringing that project forward now for uh, for for letting. Um, it would essentially pave it paves two and a half miles of uh, of trail makes two and a half miles of new trail that would extend from the middle roundabout on University, so of the three roundabouts, we would start at the middle one, go to the west, um, into the Hunziker development. Um, then we get on an old railroad bed that's been vacant for, for many years, and then stay on that bed uh, through some private property, um, then to get on to University property, go down to 260th, Street, which is a gravel road, stay north of 260th and parallel that all the way over to R38, connect with the R38 bike lanes. That's the plan. Um, we have acquired all of the easements necessary um, to do the work, and um, at this point we're, we have the design ready and just ready to move forward with uh, getting bids on it. Um, last night, the Conservation Board did consider it and recommended approval to move forward with, um, with uh, soliciting bids. So, any questions on that? I don't have a question. I want to say that I know how hard you worked on all of TELC. This one presented some particular challenges given the easements that were needed to pull this together. And um, congratulations and thank you. Or thank you and congratulations, OK? Because um, you really stuck to it. And I know that there were a couple times you probably wanted to just breathe deeply, OK? But thank you, because this really connects in the research part to get down to the heart of Iowa. you got to get on some public roads, et cetera. But it still is a connection, so thank you. I think that, and, and thank you, Boris. I, I think that this is really you know, we have had some hurdles with, with getting those um, those easements and the such, um, as we do with most trail projects. But this one, it's been it's, it's been really nice that that even though we had those hurdles in the beginning, there is so much excitement from those folks now that we have the easements from, and and this is, if you will, leveraging or generating even some more interest in other community betterment projects in that area. And so it, it, it's incredible. This trail is really spurring um, some more, uh, some more, just some good quality of life improvements. Uh, would be good for the community. So, uh, so it's incredible to see, it's nice to see, and, and uh, yeah, that doesn't happen uh, every day. So it's nice to be able to bring it forward. So that's good to hear because I can I can see where there could be a reaction of 
this is so close to my property, this is going to bring people I don't know, you know, biking by my property, kind of a, we should call a NIMBY movement. And you didn't run into that, or how did you? We, we, we did. did. How did you count we did. Um, we did it in the beginning, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were able to successfully work with some folks and transition from that to some real accepting um, attitudes or philosophies mm -hmm. on it now and really embracing it. Um, and there were some others that we knew that we had some real concerns with. We did a reroute early on um, uh, through the Hunziker development because we because the trail would have been so close to a house that, mm -hmm. that almost literally you could have reached out from the deck and shaken the hand of people on the trail. <laughs> and we knew, you know, that really wasn't right. going to be palatable. Mm -hmm. And so Hunziker was wonderful to work with in their development, and uh, so we rerouted it through that development. And, and they were fabulous to work with. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's been one of those things. It's just yeah, when we identify hurdles, we've, we've been able to work through them. So it's been a success. That's it's going to be a well-used trail, I'm sure. You know, what you're connecting to. So, any other questions? No, just thanks for being here. I know a number of people, as I know you do, who utilize the the trail. Um, the more connectivity that we can be, um, just um, they're excited about it. Can you remind us how much the estimate is on this project? For the cost we, of hand? Yeah, the cost of we have we have enough um, we have enough in the available balance to cover the construction covered. cost okay. estimate right now. That with mm -hmm. the with the um, uh, last million dollars of TIF that we went ahead and did that covers it plus what they've been able to raise through grants, right. et cetera. Exactly. So, so it's we, totally did some, we were able to secure some grants for earlier phases that um, allowed us to have some more funding available for this. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So this is an also a public hearing item. So I would open the public hearing regarding the consideration of the Chelk Corridor Phase 3 final plans specifications and form of contract and authorization to release bids. Anybody who would like to comment, would you please come to the microphone? Seeing nobody come to the microphone, I will close um, public hearing and um, entertain a motion for approval of the phase three final plan specifications and form of contract and authorization to release bids. I think it's my turn and I will move that is so stated. <laughs> I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Olson. Aye. Edmonds. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Thank you're you approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Carry Thank you. on. Thank you very much. Well, now you're still here again. Or Mike is, right? Mike. Yes. Mike, you have the next item as well. Discussion sure. and you, consideration. You yeah. you some reason I was thinking Mark was in here between no, us. No, it's because you keep seeing her name up there. That's why. Sorry. Here. You're still. You're still <laughs> on. So, discussion and consideration of payment to the Army Corps of Engineers for $36,000 to complete everything, right? Mm -hmm. Or to complete something. <laughs> Mike, give us an explanation. Oh, yeah. Uh, not all projects can go, even though the last one has gone, has taken some time, mm -hmm. it's gone fairly smoothly. This one has taken much more time and, and is not anywhere near as smooth. Um, you, you recall we entered into an agreement with the Army Corps um, two years ago, last October, for them to transition the property, uh, to give, give the county the property that was for the old interstate right away, if you will, um, uh, north of Ames, between Ames and Story City. Uh, the Army Corps has been going through that process. Uh, in order to dispose of any federal property, they have to go through a, a checklist of, of disposal procedures, um, and one of which is um, a cultural review, um, archaeology review. And, <clears throat> and so they're going through that with this, and um, uh, essentially they have used the available money 
in what we paid them up front for the contract and so they need more money in order to complete the the cultural review the reason that it's over what was anticipated is that they have found they have more findings than they thought and and so it's taken more work from the cultural team they contracted out and their staff doesn't do the work that they contracted out to an archaeology firm that does the work so at the moment when at the moment they're not moving forward and they're not able to complete that study without this additional money so originally they had a two-year two-year deadline to get it to us which would have been last October at the moment it's it's no progress on it and they're anticipating if we get this funding allocated or paid to them then they'll get the project going again and anticipate a 21 transition date there's still a lot of things that they will need to do but this this I would say they're clearly over halfway there 75% of the way through the process of getting it to us all in all this is a hundred and ninety seven acres that would that would come to the county at no at no direct cost in other words we're not we're not buying that property instead we're reimbursing them for their procedures that they must go through to to transfer it so I think you're familiar with the project that we've talked about it in the CIP session and I know Loris you've been involved in some of the earlier discussions too on this so I will say that the Conservation Board discussed this last night they did recommend that the Board of Supervisors approve this today and the Conservation Board supported taking this out of the energy transfer fund not out of the general fund so with that I would entertain any questions you may have. How much did we pay originally to the Army Corps of Engineers? I'm sorry. How much did we pay originally to the Army Corps of Engineers? 152,000. So okay so we really still with that and this additional 36 quick math we're looking at maybe a thousand an acre. Doesn't seem like. Yeah I'm real careful I don't I don't want to say that there won't be anything else. There may be I don't want to say that but but at the moment yes it's still looking like it's a it's a very reasonable we would be acquiring roughly 200 acres a little under a thousand dollars an acre right now and it would go toward essentially improving the buffer of the river going through the county. What's the likelihood they're going to find something that would would give us problems in terms of our use public use of the land? I can't imagine. Not anticipating anything. Okay. Just when you're well they're doing a study they're wanting to see if there's any. Yeah we're not anticipating anything any problems with what we'd like to do with the property. So and I think that they've been throughout they've 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 done their their work throughout the property so they know in broad brush strokes what's there from a cultural standpoint. So I'm not expecting any surprises. They need to do some more work on some kind of a cluster of findings a cluster of areas that they've that they have discovered and that's what that's what their work is going to be. Any more ideas or hints of when we might get this wrapped up? What's that? Any more hints of when this might get wrapped up or? The archaeology? Yeah. This should be they'll get back on they'll get back out as soon as weather permits now. Okay. And so I'm thinking they've only got a few weeks left of maybe four weeks of the archaeology work left. Field work left. Okay. 
So, yeah, it, the majority of the rest of that timeline is the federal approval process. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, who knows? Who, who knows how long that Who will knows be. at this point? So, yeah, it's just, I know you've been surprised a lot. Oh, there's another step. You know, it wasn't real transparent well, from the well, beginning. That's, and but, that's why I caution my words here a little bit. That you know, it's out of our control to some extent what, what might happen. Okay. Any other questions? No, because you asked the question I had, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then if there are no further questions, I'd entertain a motion for approval of payment to the Army Corps of Engineers for the 36000 to complete the phase one cultural study. Uh, so moved, but I just want to clarify, that's through the energy transfer fund, the 36000 yes. is that correct? Yes. Correct. So, so the coming yes. energy transfer, transfer fund. Good. So. I said it. Okay, and further discussion? If not, Edens? Aye. Olson? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Thank Fingers you. crossed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the work on this. Uh, next item, discussion and consideration of appointment to the Condemnation Commission of Leroy Kester. This is actually something that we were working on last year, and through going through some, some spreadsheets and some forms, we discovered that um, we had asked Leroy if he would uh, serve on the Condemnation Commission, and he agreed and thanked us for that, and then we never got it on an agenda. So it is on the agenda for today to approve Leroy Kester for, uh, to serve on the Condemnation Commission. I'd move that we approve um, uh, appointment of Leroy Kester to the um, Condemnation Commission. Um, and that would be per the revised form, I think. Yes, it's yeah. revised. Okay, it's thank done. you. All right. Then leave off the per the revised form and put a period there, please, Shelley. Second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. If not, Olson? Aye. Edmonds. Aye. Merkin, aye. Okay, thank you. Next, we have discussion and consideration of asset recommendations for Story County funding for fiscal year 21. And Carla and Sandra King. Carla up, Sandra King. Thank you. Good morning Good again. We're back to discuss the final FY 2021 asset funding recommendations that were completed during the asset allocation process. At its December 17, 2019 meeting, the board approved a 5% increase in general basic local option and public health funding for asset. And of the $4.5 million allocated to asset, the county's contribution was over $1.5 million. I'd like to briefly highlight a few areas that may be of particular interest to the board, uh, starting with page one, line 27, Boys and Girls Club. Uh, 24,726 uh, was recommended for allocation to the Boys and Girls Club and that's of the uh, 24,775 that was requested of the county. This past summer, the Nevada site suspended its summer program due to lack of participation, but they're planning to uh, have the program up and running again. Do they, so, know, do they know when they plan on having that up? Mm -hmm. Well, it's up for right oh, it oh. Yeah, it, uh, it was just the summer portion of the program that they suspended, and then um, it, it resumed this fall, past fall. Would this ask then, was this ask though for the entire year? Correct, the funding is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, page 3, line 80 for HERDA. 113,856 was recommended for allocation uh, to HERDA for transportation, and that's of the 114,713 that was requested of the county. Last year, HERDA didn't draw down all of, their, all of its local option funding, and that was due to uh, sort of a misunderstanding of how that was supposed to be drawn down. That was clarified at the, during the asset allocation process. And so they should be able to do that this year. Uh, page three, line 106, LSI, $3,000 was recommended for allocation and that is fully funding their $3,000 request. 
uh, recognizing the high demand for child care in the county, the volunteers did try to allocate funding for child care as much as possible. Uh, LSI, one of their um, services that LSI provides is crisis child care. Uh, the service is provided by registered in-home providers and has been a challenge to access during the daytime hours because the providers are at capacity. Now, page four, uh, line 127 through 128, Micah. $6,242 was recommended to al for, uh, for allocation to MICA, and that's of the $10,253 requested. The STEPS 2 success program was discontinued. Uh, this FY and an increase in funding was requested for its food pantry. That allocation to the pantry was nearly doubled last last year. While we're on, Micah, may I ask a question? It's not on your highlights, but if we can go to the dental clinic. And I, uh, I see on the dental clinic that um, they received almost everything that they requested, nine, overall 99.46%, correct, of what was requested. Okay. Um, if you look at, it's just a small amount, though, um, from 190, and I'm having trouble reading this morning, 195,000 was the total allocation. It was 187,000 the year before, so we've only picked up about $8,000 to MICA. So, uh, did they indicate that they may be actually still needing more for the dental clinic? I'll look at you or to uh, Lisa Heddens, who sits on well, that board. I just want to make sure you're clear because it looks like last year their total received was 187. Um, yes. They requested 200,000 and got 198. So they got all. Um, so yes, they got 8,000 more than last year. They requested 10, uh, 13,000 more. Yeah, 9,000. Okay, thank you. I'm having trouble reading the numbers okay. today. Well, okay. 87, 98, 11. I don't see 98, 11, but no, 198 minus 187. So they okay. got. The 13. Right. So my real question is, is did Mike tend to indicate even their ask was high enough to cover what we know in the past um, they've been concerned about making their budget? So then I look at Lisa, who sits on their board, and these requests are put in quite a bit in advance. So was there any indication that they still might be short in planning for fiscal year 21? Well, I do know from serving on the micro board that they are putting in some other strategies um, to help with the dental clinic. They, um, from our last board meeting, um, they are not coming to anyone yet for any increased funds. They want to, um, uh, they're increasing, or they put some other parameters of um, some goals on the number of clients they need to see there. Um, they're on a contract basis with the, um, uh, dentists that provide the dental care there. Um, so they have made some changes. They want to give that some time to see how that okay. how that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, next one is the Salvation Army, page 5, line 171. Uh, $4,688 uh, of general basic and local option funds were required. Alloc uh, recommended for allocation to the Salvation Army, and that's of the 5000 that was requested. <coughs> and that was to fund its food pantry this year, which it has a record number of users. Um, and the local option uh, request for funding was a new request this year. They have also discontinued uh, the bill payer program. Uh, there were only a few clients being served by the program, and uh, those Clients have either been transitioned to other services or they no longer need the service. Next one is the Volunteer Center on page 5, line 182 through 184. The Volunteer Center was allocated or recommended for uh, allocation of $2,832 of its, the $4,000 request for county funding. And that was for volunteer management and youth engagement services. The county funding recommendation is about 71% of the request, and the recommendation is $444 less than last year's 
uh, allocation. The volunteers were guided largely by funder priorities, which was shared um, with everyone at the beginning of the um, allocation process. Many of the agencies, many of the asset agencies recruit or manage their own volunteers. Uh, either they have someone on staff specifically for that purpose or they add volunteer management um, to another an employee uh, responsibilities. And the asset volunteers uh, were also considering duplication of services as they recommended funding allocations. I'd like to come back to this after Sandra runs the whole list. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. I'd like to come back after you run the whole list. Okay. All right. And the last one here is YSS. That's on page six, uh, lines 205 through 206. After being notified that county dollars can no longer be used to provide funding related to mental health services, the asset administrative team, along with CICS, informed uh, YSS of that change. And the asset administrative team also asked YSS to restate its budget and request funding for services that were not related to mental health. They requested funding for service coordination for substance abuse and to fund a multidimensional family therapy position for activities uh, not reimbursed by insurance. And so the request for county funding for FY21 was originally $90,062, and that was, um, so $45,025 was recommended for allocation for service coordination, $45,000 was recommended uh, for allocation for substance abuse and co-occurring treatment for a total of $90,025 for these services. And these are county dollars that were moved from juvenile court system into the asset process on FY20. I'd like to come back to that also once we're done with the list. Okay. That's all. Okay. 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 So um, I think that we are seeing with asset that as the county grows um, uh, and we get new people in and new providers in, requests for new services, that there's discussions that need to occur with asset. And we already know that asset funders are being asked to talk about priorities, right? So that's one of them. But also another thing that I think comes up, and it comes up with the Volunteer <coughs> Center, and this is a, a somewhat a repeat of, some of the discussion was had with the joint funders meeting with some of the volunteers, is that what, what exactly do you do with a service like the Volunteer Center? And are there other services, although this was just focused on the Volunteer Center this year, is about how do you fund something that has existed longer than asset has existed and the community has um, has embraced it, but also as time moves on and things change, does it fit into the asset model? And um, I, I've asked I asked Sandra to invite both Andrew Allen and Ann Owens here today. Andrew from YSS and Ann from um, uh, from the Volunteer Center because I felt that both the situation with YSS and the situation with the Volunteer Center this year are indicating that discussions need to be to move forward about how do we handle situations like these two that came up this year. For Volunteer Center, I think the shock, I know for me, was finding out that the asset admin team had told uh, the Volunteer Center, or asked them, I guess, depending on how you want to look at it, that if any asset dollars had to go to only recruit uh, volunteers for asset-funded agencies. And that was a real surprise to me, having followed the asset process for, well, the register brought me here in 2002. I think I went to my first asset hearing in 2003. So definitely that's a big change. And I don't know that at any point that prior boards of supervisors had ever asked 
that we restrict, in fact, the opposite. We wanted our funds to go to all volunteer activities because there are a lot of volunteer activities that aren't associated under an asset-funded agency. Uh, Special Olympics, uh, Iowa Games, uh, we've got um, uh, the Main Street Fourth of July Parade, all of those types of activities, and over at the university aren't. So the discussion that came up then when the joint funders met with uh, right at to get the first, uh, to get these allocations, and I thought um, there were a couple of good observations. Mayor John Hala had one to my question. My question was, well, can we just say we don't want our funds that we're giving considered asset funds when it came to that restriction? And Mayor Hala pointed out very, I think, wisely that if every agency starts saying, well, we're giving according to what the asset volunteers accept for this particular um, item, then asset will fall apart. So I thought that was a very wise observation, all right? There was some more discussion. The uh, asset volunteers who were there talked about their frustration in trying to figure out where it fit into the priorities for asset. So um, they did drop the asset volunteers because of, of saying it didn't fit with the priorities. They dropped the amount of funding that the county would have most likely given otherwise. So what I would like to do today is suggest that on a separate agenda uh, in the next couple of weeks that we look at making a separate donation from the county out of just general funds to make up that difference to ask to the volunteer center for this year. So they requested four thousand dollars. We gave them twenty I'm sorry it bounced off of my screen. Uh, thirty thank you. Okay. So that we would fill in that gap. Um, for them for this upcoming year out of general funds. And that money specifically would continue to be a, not counted as, as the asset funds um, and instead be a separate gift to us, which was a suggestion that came up at that meeting that night. And of course, we've done that with a couple of other agencies. We did it with HERDA. We've done it in the past with MICA for extra funds. So that's what I'd like to suggest and also if Ann wanted a chance to speak about that, um, obviously moving forward, there's going to have to be discussion, it sounds like. Even the asset volunteers were struggling with how do we fund this agency under the asset. So, okay, and then as far as YSS. Um, I didn't I, hear them struggling. Huh? I, I, what, did, what happened that you thought the volunteers were struggling with the decision? Um, I talked to a couple. The two sitting next to me right before the three, were they? Okay. Yes. It wasn't during the meeting. Then, was then a I heard the. Meeting. I heard. Was it Samantha way down at the end, who talked about the what do we do with this and where are the and how do they fit in the priorities? Then the gentleman who was not next to me, but the one right beside me, he made the comment that he said this. I think the way that it should go would be that um, the asset the other asset agencies include a fee that they're paying to the volunteer center. And as a result of that, then we would have no problem paying for that because their rates would go up. So that is how I heard by the struggle part of that. And the man next to me did say that it was difficult. He did, yes. So, okay. Um, so then as far as the YSS situation, I, I um, I am still uncomfortable with it, um, and I understand what has happened, that timing ended up that after YSS turned in their budget, then it was pointed out because at the state level, DHS and the uh, state auditor have gone in and they've said, wait, there are some programs that are still being funded that are what we consider mental health programs that are being funded by county dollars outside of the regional system. So that was the issue. And in working through that, my discomfort in part was that um, the admin team said after the fact, go back and find other dollars, find other services you didn't submit for. And I, and I struggle with the fairness of that. We do know that after asset budgets get turned in, originally the requests, 
agencies then find out, especially when you're looking at, you know, six to seven months before, and then this is talking about money that they're going to spend 12 months further in the future. We know that everything that they're projecting at that time doesn't happen. So certainly I understand wanting and the asset team saying you need to go back and rework your budget uh, because this may affect some other funders. But they literally instead were told go find other things we could pay for. And I don't believe that that's how the asset system was designed to be set up, to guarantee funding, because it's not guaranteed. Until we vote today, YSS doesn't know if they're getting that money or not. So to go back and tell them, go find something else we can give you $80,000 for, seems to defeat the purpose of asset entirely, which is tell us what your needs are, and we will fund the needs. And so both of these programs that they substituted instead were not enough of a need for them to request the first time around. I'm not sure if that's Okay, thank you, because I am interpreting. So what, uh, could you clarify? Because that's how it came across to me, but that doesn't mean I've interpreted it right. They were advised to restate the budget. They have submitted the application on time, but the information that came down from DHS was after they had submitted the application. Mm -hmm. That's why they were asked to restate the budget. But why did they add new services? They added new services because they, were, they said that those services um, they already provide, but cannot be paid for through insurance. And what they were advised was to submit their application for non-mental health services. But they didn't submit them first time around. That's my point. Because they didn't know there was the problem. The problem came up later. DHS notified, if I'm correct, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but DHS notified notified you after the budget deadline, after the budget mm -hmm. was submitted, that there was an issue. And that wasn't anything that anybody was aware of, correct? Right. But that would mean minus the $80,000, because we've been told we can't pay for the requested services. My issue, my problem, is coming back with substituted services that weren't requested first time around. That's my problem with it. I understand they got caught in that $80,000 was all of a sudden they're looking at risking losing it. Pants all of the phone calls and the meetings and we all talked to Andrew Allen about it. But they substituted services after the fact. That's how I view this, okay? And I'm uncomfortable with that. I, I think, yes, it was DHS and I think the Department of Management that came, down, came okay, with that management. specific uh, language, uh, not the auditor's office. Um, there are often times that, I mean, you've got an agency that did a budget to fund a program with anticipating, uh, hoping, I guess I should say, not necessarily anticipating, that that would be funded for a program that they had been uh, mm -hmm. wanting to do. As has been stated, you've stated it, um, uh, and uh, Supervisor Merkin, that the Department of Management came back and said, okay, no, we cannot do They've been kind of cracking down, making sure that those dollars that are mental health dollars are not coming out of a general fund. I don't think it was probably something that YSS wasn't necessarily looking at. I think it was more of a case of, okay, we can't, we can't fund this in this particular manner, so we have to look at other dollars internally or from other funding sources to fund what we wanted to. So we have to move to what would be able to be funded uh, with county dollars. I think is what they've tried to do is kind of shift that mm -hmm. around. I mean, oftentimes uh, when notifications come down afterwards, ASSET has come back to a number of agencies and said, hey, we've got this new information. You know, they're not there to hurt the agency. They want to help them. Um, uh, or at least give them the opportunity. There is no guarantee. You're absolutely right. There is no guarantee they're going to get get funded. That's why they put out the budget and and identify what some of their needs are. Um, but I think it was because of this particular circumstance that they had to shift gears and what they had initially anticipated their avenues of funding is what they were looking at. I understand they shifted gears. 
I, I'm still bad. Like I said, well, I'm going to always question about why these were not important services enough before for YSS to ask. We know as an agency, YSS has never been shy about asking for what they need from asset and not getting it all. So here's where I'd like to move forward on this now, okay? is that I'm still concerned with at least the $45,000 that is going toward what is the um, co-occurring treatment. So I turn to staff here and ask, how is it that co-occurring treatment, which means both mental and substance abuse at the same time, is not covered under the mental health ruling or interpretation? The the specific funding that YSS is um, requesting here is for multidimensional family therapy, mm -hmm. for uh, which is an evidence-based practice, and there mm -hmm. are functions that that the therapist has to do within that practice that is not reimbursed by insurance. Um, and so YSS would be looking to bill the county for those services provided that are not reimbursed by, by insurance. And in, in this therapy practice, YSS has indicated is specific to substance use treatment. It is not, not co-occurring. It, it's specific to that substance use um, treatment that they're providing to individuals. So they, they do see that it fits within this area. So the description of saying co-occurring itself we would not be billed for anything that would be co-occurring, correct? We emphasize with YSS that anything mm -hmm. they bill the county for could not be associated with mental health. Okay, super. That makes me feel good that we've done our follow-up on that. Then coming back to the service coordination as it's listed now, if I understand how this is, the original plan is that any any youth that presented, or any person, but basically youth, 24 and under, who presented with behavioral mental health issues would be put in a service coordination program, and that's the one that we that they're not allowed to bill county dollars for. So instead, this has now been expanded that. If I understand this correctly, all youth who come through YSS would be assessed and then they, if they were not mental health, they would be billed for service coordination. We would be billed. But if they did have a mental health diagnosis, then YSS would be providing that service for free? Well, the way YSS or not really does well. that service coordination would include parents and family and you know there may be meetings or some activities that they're uh, doing that don't have the uh, client in there at that time the youth in there at that time even. Okay. so again we did emphasize a number of different times with them that it can't be for mental health so, so they did understand that Okay, I appreciate you putting all of this on the record, explaining this. Um, as I said, I'm, I still have I still have some concerns about this. If it were not for the fact that there were legislation down at the state right now that may be playing fruit basket upset again with how we fund mental health, I would probably fight stronger against the funding for this year. But recognizing that there may be a model going forward that might in some other way take county dollars out and there may be new rules coming forward, um, I'm comfortable in voting. I'm, I'm willing to vote for this this year um, uh, on this. I, once again, um, I, I wonder, uh, according to the admin team, only once before has the admin team ever allowed so late in the game a agency to go back and even restate their budget. And that was before there was any rules about what county government could or could not go for and go back and restate that budget. And that was for the Richmond Center. And so I'm very um, uncomfortable, but I am one voice of three here, and then there are five funders, soon to be four now, right? The CICS is out, per se. Okay, but I do think that as the priority discussions go, that should be something on the priority discussion should be something that I believe Jody Eaton, who is, is president, is she president of CICS? CEO. CEO of CICS said about this situation with YSS is 
Well, that's normally built into the rate. I mean, this is basically intake. So I, I wanted that on the record. And I, I saw that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So at that particular point in time, I appreciate it when I'd ask that we allow Anna Owens to speak. If she were able on the other issue, if Let's that's my Let's make sure well, we're done with the YSS conversation first. Yeah, yeah. I just thought, Did yeah. you have anything else to... Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. You know, I do think that we'll be watching the service coordination and maybe future-wise that's what they will do is it'll be referenced or, or seen as built into into their, their base thing. I kind of look at their service coordination model here is, you know, we used to have on the legislative books called SINA, Families in Need of Assistance. Um, and for this, for my conversation, it looks like that's what they're trying to do. It's not just addressing the kiddo mm -hmm. that they're helping, but it's the entire family. Um, and it's not always, you know, it's it's taking out that mental health portion. Um, but if that, that child is to um, reunify with their families and to help build better family relationships, you can't just look at just the one individual. It's really finding the services for the entire family. And that was my understanding of how they're trying to uh, run this particular program. But I do think uh, with anything um, that we always kind of watch it. Um, and that's where you have the asset team and the mid-year reports and their annual reports on it. Um, and then they're, when they do their annual reports to us, um, it's where we do our due diligence to find out how are things actually working or not working. And I would simply add that I understand very well why the administrative team utilized the flexibility they did. I think it was appropriate because I think that there was some last minute discussion or some last minute information from the Department of Management that nobody anticipated. So I want to thank the admin team for working through a difficult situation. Thank you. I'd like to make just a, a comment about that service coordination also. Um, the way YSS explained it to us was it's it's um, targeted towards non-mental health services. Um, as we know, YSS provides a wide array of services that are just not specific to mental health. So that's where their, their targeting is in those other areas. Okay. Um, let's go back to the Volunteer Center. And let's make sure we, um, Ann, I want to give you some time, but let me first make sure that we've asked all the questions that we have of staff. Could you just give a, somebody just give a summary of why the decision was made to not fund all of the requests to the volunteer center? Well, there were a couple of different reasons. Um, one reason is that the uh, the volunteers did uh, were uh, told to take a look at the um, the priorities of the funders priorities and see where the different service requests. Fit. And um, for the county, uh, the volunteer center was within the third priority category. And that, so it did not make it to the top like basic needs and some of the other um, services that were requested. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, because some of the agencies were doing their own volunteers about um, handling their own volunteer management, about 70%, um, then they also saw the implication and reduced funding as a result of that. And the volunteers have been looking at um, a software program that was uh, demonstrated um, by staff from ISU um, that would provide some of the volunteer management services. And that's just uh, one of the things that they've been looking at, but they're also trying to um, allocate the dollars or recommend allocation of the dollars as efficiently as possible. And so that was part of their consideration as well. I have one follow-up question there, which is why are the majority of the agencies doing their own volunteer management? Um, the volunteer center director did indicate that she had uh, had some challenges uh, finding volunteers that wanted to um, provide volunteer services for um, okay. the human services agencies. Not every volunteer is interested in volunteering for human services. Okay, great. And I'll have some follow-up questions on when, when you have some time. Does anybody else have questions of either Sandra or Carla? What was that we... lowest tier? The lowest tier? Yeah. I'm sorry, I just don't recall it. On the priorities? Services yeah. promoting self-sufficiency. Okay, thanks. 
and education and awareness was part of that, which is the area they fund. Also, I, I think it, something that agencies run into is they need to complete background checks um, right. on volunteers, and so perhaps that's, in, in some, depending on the volunteer work, it could be that there's a lot of training that needs to take place as well um, with that agency before that person can be deployed. So those could be some reasons why uh, agencies are taking that in-house more. I have one question for Carla or Sandra, but it's not about the Volunteer Center. It was jumping back up to the Boys and Girls Club. So the, they're billing per service unit, correct? So Boys and Girls Club? I'm sorry. They're billing per service unit, per child interaction time. Yeah, so the fact that service. they've requested the 28,000, even or 24,000 and some, even though that was for their summer program, they're most likely to only pull down then if they don't redo their summer program this year then they'll only pull down for doing the school year correct correct yeah it's it's fee for service so they bill after the service has been provided so i would anticipate we won't see them utilize all of their funding for <coughs> fy20 because they didn't provide that during this the summer last year okay thank are you. there any other questions for staff and thank you for your patience. Would you like to say a few words to us? And please come to the microphone if you would. Sure. Introduce yourself. Thank you for your time. This is this is a hard, hard thing for me personally, as I'm exceptionally passionate about the role volunteers play in any nonprofit in the resilience and sustainability of any community and the impact volunteering makes. Um, for me personally, um, starting as a volunteer as a teenager is what's led to my career today. Um, this is a substantial cut overall. I appreciate Supervisor Olson's um, suggestion of pursuing the additional funding at a separate agenda. Um, in addressing the, we have been working for two years. Um, the Volunteer Center, I, I have my notes and I'll do my best to stay on script. We have been serving Story County since 1982. We started as the Volunteer Bureau and a service offered through the United Way of Story County. Back then in the early 80s, volunteering, um, volunteering has been and is essential and fundamental to any nonprofit organization. Most any nonprofit will tell you um, volunteers are integral to the work they do, whether as board of directors, frontline program direct delivery, skill-based volunteering in the administration and management of the organization. Many, many, many nonprofits, including many of the asset-funded agencies, started as 100% volunteer driven. And as they grew, as the programs refined, as regulations change, they bring on paid staff, but still engage volunteers. In the early 80s, it was volunteer matching. You would call in and say, I'm available, I'm interested, here's my contact information. Agencies and groups would call in and say, we need volunteers, X date, X skills, who do you have, and information would be exchanged. From there, it moves into volunteer management, and it becomes along the lines of HR, and that's everything from identifying needs where volunteer positions could be created, the great recruiting tools and recruiting messages and the recruiting methods for the volunteers, what training and supervision and what programming, what evaluation is needed to determine the volunteer success, the success of the program based on volunteer involvement and the impact. And I, I, I do have a point to this in the interest of brevity. Then it's moving on and as nonprofits evolve, as management evolves, we become volunteer engagement. And that is the life cycle of the volunteer center. Where do we fit in, in terms of duplication of services? Up until 2018, in every historic record I can find is the Volunteer Center, when I started in 2015, our focus was individual community members who wanted to volunteer, engaging people or groups who wanted to volunteer and identify in helping to identify and address community needs. 
and it was focused on the on the volunteers we refer and connect to those opportunities we do that by connecting them with agencies providing those services we did that by providing days of service like family volunteer day the collaborative winter weatherization and Martin Luther King Jr. Day in large single service days where people could come out, see the impact they can have by volunteering, find a cause that speaks to them, and then be connected on to agencies that are doing more in that work. We then also focus many of our efforts on being youth and family friendly to hook volunteers at an early age because research shows the sooner people start volunteering, the more likely they are to continue volunteering throughout their lives. In 2018, we were informed that our funding from ASSET, which made up 75% of our budget at that time, would be restricted to serving the 31 other ASSET funded agencies effective this fiscal year, 1920. We started planning and revising our services. I adjusted my time as the only paid employee to be more available and connect with the agencies to find out what their volunteer needs were, how the volunteer center could be of service, explain to them what our existing services were, and identify where we might create new programs that meet their needs and help them connect with the volunteers they want. We substantially revised the way we account for those asset funds, and we substantially revised our reporting and our statistical evaluation of our program success to track it asset versus non-asset agencies. In terms of the duplication of services, yes, 70% of the asset agencies have volunteer coordinators, directors, managers, or volunteer engagement is assigned to someone's responsibility in those organizations. It absolutely should be. That agency is responsible ultimately for engaging those individuals and groups in advancing their social mission. They are responsible for paying their own staff, the volunteers they engage in. They are responsible for supporting those individuals with the tools and the resources and the knowledge they need to advance their social missions individually. Expecting the volunteer center to do all of that engagement, the planning, the identifying, the recruiting, the evaluation, the supervision, and the recognition of those volunteers for each of those 30 agencies would require the Volunteer Center to be a subject matter in 30 different agency social missions. And I would need, our agency would require a much larger budget to do that. We offer a means of promoting volunteering to the individual, making it seem possible making it seem like something they want to do, connecting them with what their heart's passion is to be part of this community and be part of engaged in it. In terms of the funder priorities, we don't fit. If you look at us from serving agencies, we absolutely don't. If you look at it as we provide an opportunity for people who want to volunteer, people who want to develop soft skills, youth who want to, who could benefit from a volunteer experience to develop critical thinking skills and 21st century skills that they need to be successful adults going forward in the community, to learn how to be engaged as citizens in their community. We exist for individuals and that's where we would fit. But when you say we serve agencies, you take us out of the priorities. You absolutely do. And even I struggle with how I fit in those priorities and how these programs fit. When you talk about the referral system from Iowa State, that is a give pulse system. It is another, as I said at the asset hearing, that system is another volunteer referral system. And if you Google volunteer referral, volunteer management, volunteer sign up, you will find at least 30 different agencies and organizations that offer those systems. Give Pulse is one. Give Pulse is marketed and designed for university driven community engagement. It is driven from an individual volunteer's perspective. Agencies can go in and create accounts and post opportunities. But its original intent and design is to be a social, mobile-friendly application for volunteers to post when they volunteer 
track their hours, and share that information with their communities to try to inspire people through peer pressure. It is managed and supported by two graduate students within the university. It is part of the university's internet structure. So it is somewhat cost effective, but being able to access and share the data that I can do is a concern. And I would say I can give you more of my numbers and different things that we did in 2019. In terms of referrals and number services, I just completed that annual report for Points of Light, the global affiliate network of volunteer centers, but I would save that for my March report. Um, Thanks, Asset was 75% of your budget until 2018. What is what percentage of your budget? With this budget this? request, we've reduced it down to 54,000. My board has directed me, and we are working towards continuing to decrease decrease that, given the trends and these restrictions for the directions we see the community needs for volunteers and volunteer engagement, and the interest we're hearing from not only the asset funded agencies but the other agencies we partner with, and the services they want to be able to provide volunteer management training, um, volunteer management support, and for professional development for those volunteer coordinators to be able to activate corporations and employee volunteer programs to continue to support the youth volunteer programs we offer. We want to be able to diversify our funding. Let and me ask my question a different way. Mm -hmm. What was the dollar amount you received from ASSET in 2018? 99000 One dollar less than what we, one dollar more than what we received this year. For 2018 and 2019, okay, so we received the same. range in 2018, because mm -hmm. I see that 1920 was 99,000. Yes, and we received $1 less for 1920. Okay, and the total you would receive from asset um, in 2021 then is 72,000. Yes. Okay. Now, um, can you, what percentage of your work was for asset agencies, and you said you took you keep track of that. What percentage of your work was for asset funded agencies last year? 64 percent. 64 percent. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you have questions, either of you? No, and thanks, Sam, mm -hmm. for coming let to me, explain that. No, let me do, let me ask because I'm still I am still trying to understand it. Who are those other 36% of that you're that you are providing volunteers or volunteer management, recruitment management, et cetera, for? The other 130 active agencies and organizations and community events, plus the volunteer center days of service and any volunteer okay. management or professional development services we offer to any volunteer coordinator. Okay, so that would be non-social services agencies usually. Mm -hmm. Well, and it would be maybe would be even some social service agencies that aren't asset funded. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our total database has 199 agencies that serve Story County okay. that have um, accounts in our referral system, and that's the, our requirement for them to be partners. What's your largest non-human services? Story County Conservation. Okay. Followed by Ryman Gardens. Okay. And 2018 was skewed because the largest was Ragbri. I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. <coughs> okay. Supervisor Wilson has indicated she'll have a separate on up upcoming agenda. She will have a separate budget item that she'll be submitting regarding Volunteer Center. Correct. So that's not before us today. What's before us today? 
is a funding request from asset, and if I'm reading the form right, one million five hundred and thirty-four thousand one hundred and sixty dollars. Would that be correct? So any motion that is made should include that amount. Is there? Let's see. Are there any other, first? Is there any other questions from anybody before we vote? Okay, then I would entertain the motion to. Um, Fund asset recommendations in the amount of one million five hundred thirty-four thousand one hundred and sixty dollars for fiscal year twenty-one. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay. Further discussion? No. Thank you for the time we've spent. Heads. Aye. Olson. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who presented. Okay. We will go on then to. Discussion and consideration of requests by Wayne Sally for repayment options for ILEA training expenses. Alyssa Wignall will be explaining the request to us. Good morning, board. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so as the board is aware, um, we had a deputy sheriff that resigned on January 2nd, 2020. Um, when, when we hire a new deputy sheriff, there is an employment agreement between the Board of Supervisors and that individual um, that, that lays out um, a repayment plan um, as far or a repayment amount in regards to sending them to the law enforcement academy. So that's what this is about. So after Wayne Sully resigned on January 2nd, I sent a letter to him with the employment contract and the amount um, per that agreement that he is to reimburse the county. Um, after he received that letter, um, him and his wife did call. They came in um, asking if there was any um, repayment arrangements, anything like that, and, and I told them that would have to be a request to the Board of Supervisors. There is nothing laid out in this agreement that says um, other than 100% Mm -hmm. repayment by within 60 days of resignation. So that's why this is on the board's agenda today. Um, Wayne did send me an email. Um, he's not here today. I wasn't sure whether he would come or not. I did tell him the meeting was today at 10 o'clock. I would place it on the agenda um, for the board's consideration. I don't know if you want any other background information or... Well, it looks like what is being proposed in the letter that was provided mm -hmm. either uh, to make small Mm -hmm. monthly payments um, since he states in it that he's unable to pay the full 27000 mm -hmm. plus um, or for us to look at a lump sum amount mm -hmm. small obviously smaller 8746 um, but saying that that would proposing that that would satisfy mm -hmm. I'm just seeking clarification from you it was that's that is how I'm interpreting that his is, letters that is correct how, so so I did not I did not know that he was going to make that request they had just asked about a payment plan so um, when when he came um, and met with me um, the amount that he he did say he they he, he could make an 8700 payment um, that would be for costs associated with going to the law enforcement agency what that does not include would be his salary and benefits to attend, what we paid him as an employee to attend that. I did not realize that until this morning, mm -hmm. and so I happened to ask a question of Alyssa this morning, and all of a sudden that came up, and that was very enlightening to me that the way the contract reads now is they owe us for what we've paid them for their time. And that, I, I don't know that that's, well, I'm going to use the word fair again, although somebody, I have a friend who keeps on telling me the world is not fair. Okay. But but the contract, the way it w reads, certainly maybe we could work with the county attorney going forward if we're all in agreement. In the sheriff's office, it's their contract, really, okay, is about, geez, maybe we split that out. And so that rather than saying 27000 we say, here's how much it costs to go to law enforcement and here's how much we're paying you. And maybe retrieval of the cost for the law enforcement academy. Uh, and those costs seem to be be fair. Um, I wish I'd known that two years ago when I voted on only once before have I seen something like this come forward. In that particular case, the deputy was moving to the Iowa State Patrol. 
And it was just put to me as a lump sum of 27000 And I said, well, it's contract to contract. Had I known that, I might have voted differently about what we were waiving. But the other two voted to waive it. Back to the, back to the reality here now, back to the present. So, um, so that does make a difference to me because I feel uncomfortable asking someone for the amount of money for that they were paid to, yes, they were learning, but they were working, they were present, they were able to participate in our law enforcement activities according to the sheriff's department's limits or restrictions, but they were still there on the job. So I'm uncomfortable with a $27,000 debt. Um, I, having remembering the days when I was uh, unemployed myself, the uh, news agent newspaper industry has suffered a lot of a lot of problems with layoffs, et cetera. So I've been in a somewhat similar situation, and I know I needed my savings. So um, just to take all of the savings as a lump sum seems harsh. It's a choice we could have. Um, but those are my first two initial impressions, and I'm also curious what the county attorney's office might suggest or the sheriff's department as other options. Alyssa, could you tell me, so what does the contract? I, I did have legal review the contract, too, when it came through before I sent um, the letter to Mr. Selly to make sure that, that the contract did read. It says... Um, expenses in it and it and it talks about salary I mean what what we requested and I put in um, training expenses um, uh, the expenses that the employee agrees to reimburse include the county's cost of the employees paid time attending the Academy traveling to and from the Academy studying for Academy classes on county time as well as the county's expenditure for employees food lodging and tuition while attending the Academy so this is all directed. It's all spelled out in the agreement. All spelled out and all specific mm -hmm. to the academy and the training. Correct. And they're through. given, um, the sheriff's office does give them, an, they, they kind of put an exhibit in part of the agreement, an estimated cost. I mean, we don't know up front exactly how many hours and everything. Um, so they, they are given that whole breakdown. What, is, what does that estimated cost? 25000 okay. and it was actually, I went back, I had to pull all timesheets and calculate employment taxes. It was a little over 27000 is and what it came out to. How, how long has a contract like that been in place? The, I'd have to go back. I don't know if the sheriff's office, years ago they did not have this agreement, uh, they haven't signed a contract. Um, as far as I know, they've been doing it since I've been over in the board's office eight or nine years. I don't know, Captain Lenny, if you would know yeah. how long. I couldn't give you a time frame, too. I would, I'd be comfortable with the eight or nine years. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that it's not Would you come up to you the mic, yeah. please? Thank you. Thank you. It's not uncommon for law enforcement agencies to uh, require uh, new deputies or new uh, law enforcement officers to sign a contract. As you well know, law enforcement is not cheap, as any public service really isn't. Um, and so there's usually a four-year minimum contract where they uh, need to give a commitment of four years um, to the agency um, with that contract. Uh, I know internally we've had discussions about the dollar amount, what should be factored into that. Um, there's going to be a little more uh, research um, and discussion with other like counties to see how they structure their fees and reimbursements um, on their contracts, if it's just the uh, academy cost or if they're factoring in also, uh, you know, the cost of their employment and benefits and all that stuff. Um, so there is an internal discussion that we've had probably in the last few months um, regarding just the dollar amount that's listed in there and if that needs to be reviewed or um, if and we need to consider the, that. And what is the reason that we have this in our what, contract? Why, what, what precipitated us putting this in a contract? As far as the dollar amount? To no, be as far as the repayment in general. I don't know if I could answer why it was stated to be paid in full within 60 days. But just um, that it be repaid in just general. That it, uh, yeah, and That's it's just uh, motivation to keep that employee serving in your agency after you put that investment into them. Um, and uh, 
you know, so you don't have employees leaving immediately after the academy to something else. And we've, we've in the past have requested a waiver to that. The board has voted on that and waived it. And then many times those waivers get passed because uh, that individual is moving on within the law enforcement field. They're still contributing to the overall law enforcement mission, public safety mission. And I think that's been a consideration in the past for waivers. Oh, since you said that this has been in place for about eight or nine years, what was prior? Was there nothing? There was nothing. So there so was we nothing would have deputies, and, and I don't, I don't know the turnover, the actual turnover we had, um, but would, they would have, you know, they get past their year probation. I mean, the deputies are on that, and then they go to another law enforcement agency. And, it, and you look at that. Story County invested, you know, twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand in their first four months to get them certified, you know, we do like to keep them around. Right. Um, it's not abnormal to have some, some type of agreement. We also do it with tuition assistance in our bargaining contracts. We have the same, some same language. We don't have wages figured in. We just, they just reimburse um, tuition assistance to us if they leave prior to that four year period, so. How long was Mr. Selling with us again? He started, um, I did pull that, he started in April, uh, t April 22nd, of 19 and he resigned on January 2nd of 2020. So he had not met his one year. He was still in a, as a probationary employee. But we had him long enough to put him through the academy and then to begin or possibly even complete your training program internally right in the sheriff's department. So he was actively working for us. We were getting some benefit from uh, from him, uh, from his training, and that we the training we paid for. And the dates he was at IOEA were approximately. He was there. I have that noted too. Let me pull that out. Okay. Yeah, it's is it 15 weeks? They yeah. they changed the number Roughly of weeks. April through July would be a yeah. rough timeline. April okay. 29th to August 16th. August. Mm -hmm. So those are the dates that I I made the calculation based on. Once he was done with the academy. We, didn't re we don't request any of their salary back. It's only while they were attending um, Law Enforcement Academy. And, and so, I don't so, know. The, so that 20, 27000 is based on just the time at L ILEA? Correct. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that was half the time that he was with us. And did when he came back, he was a patrol deputy, right? That's correct. So when he came back, was he immediately on parole, patrol, or did you have additional training then internally? Exactly, yes. When he came back, he goes through our internal uh, training process, which is approximately another 12 weeks. Another 12 weeks not on the road? Uh, or? He's on the road, but training, so he's with other deputies at that time. So he's not out? Not get, solo, by not himself. Not solo. So in terms of, okay, so what that means is that he wasn't a fully functioning patrol officer until he was done with that because he couldn't go out on his own and usually you have your patrol deputies out on their own. That's correct. He uh, went solo okay. uh, in the last week of November. It was around Thanksgiving. Um, I would point out that we hire many people that uh, while they don't go through quite this professional training, uh, kind of this this six months or whatever, we um, hire people and we pay them to learn on the job all the time. Yeah, is, I think the reason I see or I imagine for this policy is because this is such an extensive training and it was mm -hmm. a very expensive training. And I assume the policy was to discourage people, not only to do the best use of taxpayers' money, but to discourage people from getting trained on one agency's dime and then going to another agency who will pick them up because they're already fully trained. It doesn't cost them anything. Now, that doesn't quite, isn't quite consistent with me. What, what, to me, with what you told me about sometimes requesting waivers because somebody's moving on in their law enforcement career. So that kind of gave me pause. Yeah, they did, they did request, it was back in 2017, we had a deputy go to the state patrol. My understanding is he's still patrolling in Story County. Mm -hmm. um, and Captain Thomas came and made a request to the Board of Supervisors since he would still be benefiting in Story County. And, and that board at that time did waive that. 
And that, that employee was actually here three years or more. Two. Two, yeah. He was so. here too. So it was a reduced amount. It wasn't the 100%. Okay. In, in the employment agreement, it's, there are you know, one year, it, less than a year, they reimburse it 100%. Two years, it's 75%. Three years, I think it goes down to 50. And then after they've had four years of employment with us, there's no reimbursement okay. to the county based on that. Right, and, so. and I'm just kind of going back to that 27,363.74, that's just the time from April through August mm -hmm. that's taken into account in the, or is being factored in here. So from August 17th to whenever the person left in January 2020, <clears throat> That's not calculated no, no. In here at all. No, and, and we would, that's not in the agreement. That, Even the time that he was writing with another deputy, it's not calculated no, in no. there. It's just while they go to In, in essence, we're paying them to go to mm -hmm. school. Their academy expenses, yeah. which includes mm -hmm. salary and mm -hmm. food and uniforms yep. that they need down there. So it kind of sounds like even in the private sector where you have businesses where they pay for someone to go to school, but if they leave within a year's time frame or whatever that contract, they expect the, that employee to pay back that whole tuition cost. I got that analogy correct then? That, that's kind of how it is. Is it whole tuition costs though? It, it's tuition is the 8,000 or 8,200, whatever that is, the ILEA. Mm -hmm. Would the other amount be considered, since we're paying for their time to be there, would that be considered more like um, the, they're working their way through? We're paying them to work their way through the an contract, educational program. The contract reads training expenses, and it is outlined in the contract what those training expenses are made up of. I mean, it's very clear when I look at the contract, and again, I did send it over to make sure I was interpreting mm -hmm. that contract correct prior to sending the notice to Mr. Selly, is it, it was all laid out. It said mm -hmm. wages while you're attending the academy um, and the actual fee to attend the academy, food, lodging, because um, most of the time they stay, or most of the time, I don't know if they did this last time, if they stayed on. They did. Site. Mm -hmm. but they signed that up front, so yep. they, there's no surprises to them on what they are signing into. Okay. There's full, dis full disclosure, in, in my opinion. I also see county attorney meals here, and I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to say. Well, I think you need to come up to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Get used to, come to up that, Tim. <laughs> you got to be on the record. I can go to I think it sounds to me like um, we need further fact-finding and, and consider the issue further and whether we're going to have a consistent policy across the board for how this is handled each time it comes up. Um, certainly I think somebody coming in and working for a few months um, and getting an education on the county and then leaving and going and taking a higher paying job someplace um, without reimbursing the county. I think it would set a bad precedent to forgive the entire amount, certainly, but um, I think we need to consider whether we're going to include the wages or not. And I think checking with other law enforcement agencies and seeing how they handle it. I know some of the lower paying agencies, this is a consistent problem for them, and they call it buying out your contract when you leave because they hire people, um, the smaller agencies do. And they stay a year, and then they move on to a bigger department where they can make a lot more money in the long run. You no, know, small agencies can't afford to be training people for larger agencies. And so they call it buying out their contract. Basically, yeah. is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a lot of these, a lot of these guys, I think they consider that when they take the job in a lower-paying agency, is that that's kind of what their plan is. Mm -hmm. I'd also be interested in getting some more information about our legal options when it comes even to the debt. Um, I spoke with Ethan Anderson on the phone about this, and he may, he said there was something that was a, another affirmation of debt or uh, financial debt. Confession of judgment. Confession of judgment, thank you. And then that offers a little bit more collection opportunity, because our, our big risk is we can go in, I think, right away we can go ahead and ask for the whole amount or part of the amount but if he doesn't pay it we have to go through the collection process and 
I wish him well, so I hope this doesn't happen to him, but if he it ends up down the road finding he has so many debts that he decides on bankruptcy, we're out, correct? So I'd be interested also in and that. If we were to structure a, a payment plan, I think we need to consider that more. I mean, if he's not able to pay back the entire amount right away, and we enter into some type of agreement with him, we need to draw up an agreement that's acceptable. We could make a, a counter offer, so to speak. Correct. I would be interested in more information and maybe another option that wouldn't, I mean, he could, we could say, we could take this deal, so to speak. We could say, okay, bird in the hand is bird in the hand and maybe we won't get more, but he could, then we could find out that he got another job, you know, and mm -hmm. there we, there we'd be. So I, I would be interested in seeing if there's a counteroffer that could protect the county's interests in the event that he did, did get, you know, that his financial condition improved. So. I, I know it might be, uh, uh, Captain Looney, you just kind of mentioned it, of what are other, you know, um, jurisdictions doing. I would certainly be interested in that. Um, I part of me just really struggles is you have a known contract that you've signed, um, but I understand circumstances that can change that um, and stuff as well. Um, yes, do you include the the salary portion or not? Is that the norm of what other jurisdictions do? I I don't know. You know, I don't know if that's what they normally normally do. So I would certainly be interested. It would help me to make a more Mm -hmm. um, sound and, and decision um, because I would have that additional information that we just don't have at this particular right. time. And I don't think we need to know all 99 counties. Maybe counties of similar size to Story County, maybe what the city of Ames does. And I'm you know. to reach out to some of the other cities. Yeah. They would know. I, mean, I, don't, I think that I don't would know be. Okay. I, I don't know what they do. I, I think they have agreements. I mean, there's been emails that have floated out amongst the HR professionals asking mm -hmm. if we've got agreements with so if you could get some of that information for us, and also if you could talk about what other options um, county attorney meals there would be with confession of judgment or some other some other things that might protect the county's interests, and bring this back to us, maybe that was that was going to be so. That's what you're you're suggesting. That's what I'm suggesting. Bring it back. Just would as it, a direction. Would it also be? Because I'm assuming the what is it the 60 days? It's March 2nd. It's March 2nd. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we would have time to, to have bring it back to us before the March 2nd right. meeting. What, how I would handle this, I would reach out to Mr. Sally and let him know that they had the discussion with the board and ask mm -hmm. them to come back. Mm -hmm. um, if, if not next Tuesday, the following Tuesday um, for their. The other thing I'd like to know, we talked about the 2017 situation, but has the county had other uh, request, uh, vote, waiver votes? I'd have to go back. Okay. There was one other one. I'd like to know. There was one other one. That I know of. Another employee that had been here probably less than a, less than a year. I can't recall that one. I can't remember okay. either. But Just like to know. Uh, you know, Tim has a good point too about consistency. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, could you check on those, the other one, and I'm, get us some information I was as well? Say, it's a, it was a board action, so. Okay. I, I, you I can find it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much. Okay. We will now head on to department reports. And first, Carla Webb with Community Thank Services. Like Sheriff's Office Vehicle Changeover. Oh, I'm sorry. Sheriff's Office Vehicle Changeover. <laughs> Apologize. That's what happens when I do notes on the margin. They get way down too far. <laughs> Okay. Good morning. Thanks for your time. Good morning. Uh, what we have in front of you today is uh, quotes from Caltech uh, to do changeovers on, um, I 
believe that's eight total vehicles that we have this year for a changeover. So every year as we rotate through our vehicle pool um, with new vehicles, we have um, certain equipment within those vehicles, the electronics and the light bars and all the controls, the computer stands, um, all that stuff needs to be transferred from one car to the next. We reuse what we can reuse uh, safely. Um, there's times when items are at their end of life and just need to be replaced with new items. So these quotes uh, include a mix of taking out the equipment from one car and installing it into the next car um, for that deputy. Um, and it's just kind of a mix uh, with some used, reused old equipment and some new equipment. Um, in a nutshell, that's what this request is. So there are, are hard equipment numbers in here for new equipment as well as this being removal and installation. Yeah, that price, okay. uh, the price here includes basically everything we need to get all okay. the equipment out of the old car, put it into the new car so the new car is operational. Any questions? I don't have any. We've been through this before. No. <laughs> no. Okay, then I would entertain a motion for the for the sheriff's office vehicle changeover costs. So I would move um, for the <laughs> approval of the vehicle changeover costs in the amount of within five percent of eighty thousand two hundred ninety three dollars and eighty cents. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? None. Olson. Hi. Edens? Aye. Merkin, aye. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me for skipping over. Now, Carla, it's your turn. <laughs> there she is. Okay, good morning again. Um, this is a community services quarterly report for October through December 2019. For general assistance, we assisted 26 single households and 27 family households for a total of 53. Year to date, we have served a total of 97 single and family households. Referrals to other resources, we had 229 of those during this quarter for a total of 526. We had 14 applications that were received where the individual did not return during the quarter. Um, year to date on that is 29. Primary types of assistance for rent is $16,285.50. Utilities was $1,062.63. And then miscellaneous, which includes uh, medication, transportation, and burial, that was uh, $12,072.72. The bulk of that is going to be for burial and probably a little bit of transportation in there. Uh, for substance use services, we uh, paid on three claims and year to date is seven there. Any question on those numbers at all? No. Okay. For CICS, in October, the Governing Board did appoint representatives to the Children's Behavioral Health Advisory Committee. Um, that committee held their first meeting in December, and they're meeting monthly at this time, and Supervisor Heddens is um, part of the Governing Board that's represented on that committee. Uh, the Governing Board bylaws were updated in October to align with updates that were previously made to the 2080 agreement. And then in December, something that was new this year for the Governing Board was to set uh, legislative priorities. So Lisa and I, Russell Wood and Jody Eaton, drafted a proposal that we then took to the Governing Board for their approval. Um, so those priorities have been set. They do align pretty closely with priorities established by ISAC and the MHDS Commission. Internal applications were received for consideration of the CEO appointment. Um, Russell Wood, who's currently the planning officer with Franklin County, was appointed as the next CEO. His term will begin July 1 of 20, and that's a four-year term. The Warren County Drop-In Center opened in October. Uh, those services are provided by Central Iowa Recovery. I worked with the administrative team and staff um, to complete the FY19 annual report that was approved by the governing board and then submitted to DHS. It's due um, to the state by December 1st. 
Uh, that report can be found at CICSMHDS.org if you'd like to take a look at that, or I can provide it to you as well. The finance officer, in conjunction with the administrative team, um, worked on development of the FY21 budget that was uh, taken to the governing board in January and um, has been approved. The planning officer uh, also worked with Optima Life Services for expansion of supported community living services and medication management services to Marshall County. Uh, we are we have completed a transition to the CICS crisis line um, for the CICS crisis line to the Your Life Iowa statewide line that took effect January 1st. The CICS line remains active and any calls that are received on that line are forwarded over um, to Your Life Iowa. It's the same entity answering the CICS line as um, the Your Life Iowa line. It's Foundation 2 and they also provide the most mobile response uh, dispatch services for our region. So folks can still access that service through either calling the Your Life Iowa or the CICS line. On the community services side of things, um, I participated in review of the request for proposals that were submitted for the housing study um, and have been assisting with county asset functions and training with Sandra. Um, as well as uh, we've had an administrative assistant in our office who's been pretty involved with uh, helping us with assets and getting the dollar amounts um, that have been requested from agencies into the pretty spreadsheets that we bring before you in that. So um, we're appreciative of her assistance because a lot of work goes on behind the scenes to get all that information pulled together. We completed the FY21 budget work. Um, Regarding centralized intake, we anticipate learning in April the time frame that ISAC will have set um, for the community services network enhancements. Again, with that, we do look to participate in the testing and the rollout of that. Staff continue to remain involved with various committees and task forces. Um, we attend county trainings when possible. And Aaron Rewerts, uh, CVSO, completed 87 interviews with veterans or surviving spouses. Any questions? I have. I do. Yeah. Okay. Back up to centralized intake. All right. So um, you're looking at the programming or the, the software would be available in April for the housing services coordinator position? No. no ISAC okay. will set the timeline hopefully in April for when they'll begin to work on, on the enhancements. The operations committee has to... A st they've got to prioritize the okay. workload. Uh -huh. And so we hope to learn in April what that will look like. My last communication with them is, is they, the staff was hoping beginning of FY21. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. So then when are you anticipating then after they begin that? Have they given you a time frame about how long it will take them to do that? They have not. I'm hoping to learn more right. in April on that. So then we don't, we really don't know when we'll be posting the job then. Correct, uh -huh. yeah. Um, uh -huh. Aaron and I have been talking about that and I, I want to visit with Alyssa some, some more on that um, to see if, once we kind of know what ISAC is looking at, I think that'll help us develop our timeline um, with a potential of considering if we could bring an individual on a little bit earlier than when the rollout actually happens for mm -hmm. CSN so that they um, can be trained up and work with the testing and everything that will happen. Okay, and database. I do want to make sure, a remark was made during the budget sessions that I didn't even catch mm -hmm. until later. So um, it was something about you had someone already in the office. And I am concerned that the thought was that this would not be posted and we would be, inter and that we would not be entertaining outside applicants. But you are planning on going through the... the yeah, we haven't talked in depth about what that would look like. Option or didn't want to another FTE, if they could have someone within the office move Ah, thank you. Okay, so thank that, you that for putting that in purpose. Because yeah. I have every, as one of three, every expectation that that position will be posted yeah, outside. Okay. Sense at yeah. all, that it was a position. No, it was, it was that, an outside no, the box. I mean, the board didn't want to add an FTE. They could reevaluate to see if they had 
Got it. Thank you very much. That's why I'm asking. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? So when would you imagine you might be posting the position? You have, I mean, is it, it, it might, you might wait like halfway into the fiscal year? I, kind of I would hope sooner than that, okay. um, even towards the beginning of the fiscal year, if possible. Oh, okay. It would be my hope. It, again, I mean, if ISAC tells us it's going to be latter part of FY21 before we get to this, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we might have to just relook at some things with it. Um, my hope would be that they can get at it soon. Their, the staff's initial thought was beginning of 21. So if we could bring somebody on board a few months, even before that gets rolled out, that would allow us to help get them trained, introduced to the community agencies, um, and help with that testing. So I, I apologize, I don't have a concrete time frame yet, because I'm really kind of waiting to see from ISAC what their, their workload's looking like. And they've had a changeover in um, the director position that worked with CSN late last fall, so I know they're working through that right now as well. Okay. So. Yeah, I'd hate to see this just got held up and held up. I agree. And, and not having, you know, if there was some way, yes, to do the training and also mm -hmm. maybe some person to use spreadsheets for a little while, or at least, <laughs> right? Right, yeah, okay. if we have to do things manually for a little while, that's that's doable as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, uh -uh. Carla? No. Nope. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Very Carla, good. thank you. And thanks again to everybody who worked on all of the, the asset stuff. Mm -hmm. I know that was a, a long stretch for you, so thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hello, Hello, how are you? Um, hmm. You've been sitting here wondering, haven't you? It's like, is this going to work? Is it doing it on your screen, but not up there again? samples 118. The grant covered um, for the well that goes directly to the homeowner, property owner, uh, 500 per well plugged, 300 cisterns, 1,000 for the rehabs, and then um, and then the cost is just um, paying for the lab results. Yeah. Uh, well permits issued, 10 of the water supply, 12 geothermal, and one other. Um, I just wanted to uh, share this picture with you. This uh, this well was discovered um, this year, and it's at the pharmacy here in Nevada. And um, so I guess there was a sewage backup, and uh, so they decided to um, sort of renovate the basement at this pharmacy. And a guy fell through the floor and caught himself on the floor joist. <laughs> And, um, and, then, and it's a very deep well. Fortunately, there are other people there to help them. So um, this well plugging is important for water quality, 
and for people's safety, animal safety, et cetera. So, um, and this will be plugged under our grant program. And didn't they, didn't they say at the Board of Health meeting that they had like a 12 foot stick or something and it still didn't hit the bottom or? Yeah, it's, we remember? haven't had it plugged yet or haven't had the report back from the uh, driller, but it, it would have been very dangerous had he gone down. And it's not far to the, to the um, water, so it would, it would also be underwater if he had gone all the way down. So. Yeah, yeah, thank very you there, there are other people around. Yeah, the and, the, and then, you know, how many other surprises are out there in these older buildings? I don't know. You know, this I have seen, um, like in the bed and breakfast, I've seen a well in the basement. Um, normally, they don't do that now because it's just really tough to work on wells when you can't have the boom up above. Mm -hmm. So, so just an interesting thing I thought I'd share. Um, how come this isn't working? <coughs> I think you have to use the keyboard. It, well, oh, maybe not. Um, shoot. Okay, so it's working on here, but it's not slideshow. This uh, just shows one of our larger um, well projects um, that we permitted. It's the geothermal project for this um, Ames High School. Over to septics, um, 2019 caught up with 2018. For a while, there was really lagging behind, and then just at the final months, um, caught up. So pretty constant amount of um, around 90, 92 systems in the last several years. And these are all um, full, complete new systems. It doesn't include the repairs that we see. We continue to contract with DNR to inspect septic pumpers. Um, it's, I believe, like a four-year contract, so we're in the middle of this one. Unfortunately, well, so the only ones that we inspect now on the contract is Drain Tech, which is located in Story County. AAA and, and Copal, who are um, located in Marshall County, because um, at that time when the contract was written, Marshall County did not want to um, be involved in that. Uh, so that is just a quick drive out there. They do not land the play. They bring it to the treatment plant. Drain Tech is the only one that we inspect that do land applications. Now, um, the other two, Roto-Rooter and Earls, do land application in Story County, but their offices are located in other counties, so they get the contract. And it's, it's, a, it's a money maker for the county, and I'm very disappointed, and the state only directs us uh, that we would have to work it out with other counties if we wanted part of that money for inspections. And um, so this... This really sticks in my craw, I'm just saying. <laughs> but there's not a lot we can do about it because it's just between the counties. Um, so, uh, What does the inspection involve? Um, so the inspection involves um, making sure their permits are up to date, their license, um, and then for the land application, it's setbacks to wells, uh, residents, uh, intakes, so a lot of setback things. You drive along, make sure they're um, spreading it. It's really uh, up to a lot of interpretation. The way the laws are written and the way it's done is a big gap. So there could be a company that's out of another county that can they apply in do land applications in Story County if they're doing business in Story County? or their land applications have to be back at the county that's inspecting them? Um, so the state handles the contract, so every year they submit a map, or are supposed to submit a map to DNR showing where they plan to land apply, and then they have to, and then they also submit a plan, mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then based on that, that's what the county enforces. So if they say they're land applying in Story County, even though their office is in Marshall County, mm -hmm. 
then who inspects them in Story County? It would be Marshall County. That's, they would come, was, they would that travel. That's the answer. That's yeah. what I was getting. I'm at. sorry. Yeah, they would That's travel okay. to our county and inspect. Um, they would travel. They would come to. Well, they have. Yeah, you have they to. They have to. Yeah. And they can't just say. I look at it on a map and that's okay. They Absolutely not. Physically come and spec. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So the, the big thing we're working on lately is uh, re uh, septic regulation changes. The main changes that we are proposing is a mandatory septic tank pumping every five years for existing and future septic systems. Uh, state of Iowa, no other county does this currently. There are states that uh, Minnesota, for example, they require pumping every three years. Um, we, DNR has um, looked at this favorably and even said that they wish that they could enforce something like this. So we're going forward with this. Um, and then also the other big change is that the engineer or soil professional will be required to conduct the site reviews uh, and do the soil analysis, and then the county will only be doing the oversight. So I'll be going. I'll still be going out to the sites, making sure there's consistency uh, in the type of systems we're using, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, this is one part of our home rule that still is standing. Safe, so far, wow. so good. Yeah. That's just what I thought. The state says they wish they could regulate it. The county can regulate it. I hope we still can. I hope we still can, but um, yeah. so far, so good. So far, so so Margaret, good. I have a question about the five years, all right? What happens for, let's say, the septics who have been in the ground longer than five years? Will they have to go ahead and get an inspection the first year of this ordinance? Uh, that is not in the regulation proposals. They will simply have to get it pumped Usually that will reveal plenty to show that they are um, not working. So every, so just so I want to make sure, so everyone who has a septic that's five years or older mm -hmm. will be required to get it pumped if we pass this, mm -hmm. will be required to get it pumped during uh, the rest of 20 or will it be into 21 or? Oh, well I, well I guess I envisioned, that's a really good question, I envisioned you know, it gets on the books, and then they will, they will have five years to get their tank pumped. See, and I didn't envision it that way. You well, didn't? We'll, okay. We'll have some discussion when yeah. it comes before us, because, yeah, That's and then it's like, up. what if somebody got it installed four years ago? Yeah. And then would that be just one year out, maybe in five years? Uh -huh. So that, yeah. Okay. Good question. Good okay. question. Right, that's going to be a hard one. Um, so the status, we did have our stakeholders meeting. Um, several individuals showed up, including the three of you. Uh, lots of good comments received. They were, um, they did not embrace um, the engineer requirement for uh, doing the soils. Um, it adds a lot of extra steps and it, it adds to the cost of a septic system, just up front for having an engineer get involved. It doesn't have to be an engineer, but a professional that does this. Um, but they, they agreed that now's the time. And then they also thought that um, pumping is going to be hard to enforce, but we have to start somewhere, is kind of, in a nutshell, their comments. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went ahead and made some changes to the, the draft uh, based on the stakeholders' meetings. Uh, board of Health voted unanimously to recommend to the Board of Supervisors that, that they adopt these new septic regulations contingent on attorney's review. And that's what's happening right now. Um, and then we're hoping to get probably the first week of March, hopefully, uh, get it on the Board of Supervisor agenda if it works into your schedule. So just to kind of recap, then, then if we make changes here at the board table, like maybe delineating the time frame about when everybody's got to go get pumped or whatever for the first time, then that will go back to the Board of Health and then it would come back to us. So we're looking at least two more months if we, in fact, do so, any changes any, to it. Any big changes, yeah, okay. I agree. They, uh, I know that the Board of Health wanted to see this effective like May 1st, I think that's... Um, Would you be willing to ask the uh, our civil attorney if it could be that could uh, implementation schedule could be an administrative procedure rather than included in the ordinance? 
That's a good question. I guess we don't do a lot of administrative like the state well, does. What I'm yeah, saying yeah. is, could it could it be under you know basically that that um, Margaret could just set up a schedule based on if you had if it's a 20 year old system maybe you should get it done this year if it's a 10 year old system mm -hmm. do it the second uh, year if it's a five year old system do it the third year something like that so they don't all come due because that's also going to be a resource issue if everybody who's got a septic system yeah. out there who hasn't had it pumped mm -hmm. however you know when they get put in they tell you to pump it every four years at least mm -hmm. that's what I was mm -hmm. told and what yeah. I do. So I, I can't believe, and there's a, you know, there's a lot of problems you can have if you don't. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people are doing it. Yeah. But at the same time, you might want to see, could you administratively set up a schedule? Or does that have to be included in the ordinance? Because it would be a shame to go back and have to redo the ordinance. I think it's a good question, but can it be answered administratively rather than by in the ordinance? Yeah, that's a yeah, great question. A good question to put to it, because we don't normally do administrative stuff, but I forget about that from the well, state level. We, but I'm saying, could it, you yeah. know, yeah. could Mark's position question. do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, to do something like that, or to even look at, you know, if the homeowner would provide, well, I'm not quite sure how you do that, but if the homeowner would provide or could show that within that five years time frame, it had already pumped been. it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then it would start the time frame for the next five years. Yeah. It's kind of an honor system anyway. <laughs> yeah. I hate that, to yeah. say it, but you don't have yeah. the resources to go out and talk to every owner of every right, septic right. system. <laughs> but, so, yeah. but, but we do need to have a process that says right. here's when it should be done. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and really, I think the ones we started permitting in 1972, and the ones that were put in after that, I think it all, it's almost self-regulating because um, if you don't pump it, that, that is going to show up in your yard or in your basement. Whereas the older ones that are hooked to drain tiles, they don't pump ever, and they say it's not broken because it just flies out, flies out the tank and into the, mm -hmm. you know, wherever. Dreams. So they don't perceive these systems as not working because it's not on their land and it's mm -hmm. not in their basement. So it's going to be, that's going to be the tough seller. You know, it's not broken. Why do I have to do this? Um, but those are, and those are the systems we really need to do something yeah. about for water yes. quality. So, okay. Yeah. Well, good. For our yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So moving on. Pools, tattoo, tanning for 2019. So uh, pools, 47 facilities, 15 violations, two closures due to chemistry. Uh, on the right, they sh I show a picture. That's the new story city pool. Um, fortunately, we have the engineer with the state come out and review the plans, and you know, right when for the startup anyway. And um, the only the thing that they found with this one, interesting, um, that little um, kitty area, they had to rope that off because the um, the uh, the depth changes too fast. So they catch these things, you know, you think you'd catch it all on paper, but they didn't. So um, so those things are checked, but we do have the engineer come to all these new openings and um, it's very helpful. Uh, tattoo, we have six facilities, five violations, most of them paper violations. Tanning, uh, 21 facilities, 20 violations. Um, a lot of it with the uh, paper violations, you know, record keeping, that kind of thing kinds of things. Uh, we're working, we're also working on tanning facilities, uh, proposed regulations. IDPH, um, their regulations are still on the books, but they will not be enforced. And then they also canceled all the contracts with the counties. They will continue to permit all of the systems throughout the state, a $5 fee for that. Um, and then they let us know uh, who they've uh, permitted in our county. And then so in, if we want to enforce this program, we have to have our own regulations on the books. Um, and the Board of Health, uh, that was when Supervisor Olson uh, was on the, on the board, um, suggested that, yes, we go forward with this. I do want to see that. So the, the changes that were from what the state has on the books is that the Board of Health will be uh, setting the inspection fees and we will bump that up just a little bit. 
and then no one under the age of 18 will be allowed to use a chaining device as described in the proposed ordinance. So the map will show you there that one, two, three, so there's six states that don't have um, restrictions on age. And so it's, it's very common to have restrictions on age for those folks that can tan. So again, Iowa won't have a restriction, but we will. Correct. Yeah. Does, is that a, do you perceive that as a problem? No. Or, no. no, okay. But no, I, well, I perceive okay. it as a problem that Iowa doesn't have. And I will say there, there has been bipartisan legislation to try to mm -hmm. um, put restrictions for 18 or under. Actually, it started for 16 and under, but mm -hmm. then to at least move it for 18 and under. Um, I know they couldn't garner the votes necessarily to pass mm -hmm. the House or the Senate fully to go down to the governor's office, but there certainly is a lot of interest out there recognizing um, the increased cancer uh, associated mm -hmm. with with tanning. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Um, what was I just going to say? The um, we're. The ordinance, the state, and, and then hence county, we're allowing 16-year-olds to work at a tanning facility. Um, so that's something you'll have to think about um, if it should be 18. We kept it at 16. Like then they won't tan. <clears throat> Sorry, that was a little sarcastic and that won't. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, go ahead and move it up. Thank you. Okay, uh, January was Radon Awareness Month. Um, Kathy and Stephanie put up a nice display in the front area there and uh, gave out 55 uh, testing kits. Um, as you can see, Iowa is a red state, <laughs> not politically, and, um, and so everyone needs to test, at least once. I will say that um, Real estate transfer transfers, it is not required. Complaints, um, just the full you know buffet of complaints through the year. So open burning, mold in apartments, dumping concrete and storm drains, no septic system, septic installer performance. We get complaints on chicken manure stockpiling, um, open burning of clear trees on construction sites, bats sewage backing up, burnt trailer never removed. I'm still working with them. That's one over by Hickory Grove Lake. Mm -hmm. And then um, animal confinement runoff in the creek. Um, and then just yesterday, I received another uh, manure complaint. But DNR looked into it, and there were no violations. It was just, it was more of an odor complaint. And most of the odor complaints that we get are uh, poultry, because it smells extra bad. Well, and so that's usually brought in. Go so first. The um, burnt tra trailer, you know, mm -hmm. that, wasn't that the owner, the park owner or something, was, was he out of state or out of the country or something at the time? Is that why the delay? Well. Or is that still the de delayed reason for having that removed? That, um, that's not the reason they gave me. So I talked to the manager, and she said she wasn't sure of the status. So then she gave me the attorney's uh, and number, I called him, and he said, this is the first he's heard of it. So um, to me, that's not getting right on the bandwagon here. So um, so okay. that was a couple weeks ago that okay. I talked to him. I must so. be recalling a different one. I thought no, was he was that out of state. OK. Uh, yeah, or out of the country, okay. Okay. the owner. So he's kind of, but they could still get stuff done right. with him right. being right. out of town. Right, yeah. gotcha, OK, OK. Yeah, no, that's the exact one. Okay. Um, go ahead. Mold in the apartments, all right. Obviously, there was a good series that ran. Oh, yes. Uh, about yeah. the Nevada, thank you for representing this, I think, very well in the statements there, even though we're kind of powerless right now. Which leads to my next question. Can we enact an ordinance about mold? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so mold, number one, um, there are so many different levels of sensitivity to mold. So what is really bad for you is maybe not so bad for you, mm -hmm. okay? So there's one hard thing to, to know what to do with. The other thing is, um, if you have a mold problem, 
you don't need to know that mold by name. You clean it up the same way no matter what. So we wouldn't go do any testing or anything like mm -hmm. that because if it's, if it's mold, it's bothering you, it's a problem and you need to fix it. And the way you do it is remove the moisture problem, mm -hmm. remove the food, so like the drywall that they've been working on, clean it up and, you know, and then just clean it up and, and get on from there. The biggest thing mostly with the um, landlord-tenant uh, situations is that it's a problem lots of times out of the hands of the tenant. So it's a, a, you know, a leaky roof or a basement that's not watertight, things like that. Um, so, so that's, so it's hard to enforce something that could hardly be, seem like a problem to me, but it's a huge problem to you. Okay. okay. The other big problem is that nuisances for us are public health issues. So if you have a whole apartment building that's just inundated with mold, then that could be possibly a public health issue. If you have a single you know, a tenant with this problem, then it's really a tenant landlord uh, uh, contract. So are you saying there's no minimum standard we could shove into an ordinance to make it enforceable? That's really right. I mean, I if we said if you have mold of so many particles per whatever. Right. All right. But You're saying that would be hardly hard to do. Very hard to do. Very hard. Okay. Yeah. Um, the cities, like the Ames, they have their program. Yeah. So we try to get the cities pulled in on these things to make the landlords do what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, keeping. So make them do what they're supposed to do now so you mean the city can this like Ames can enact an ordinance or is it when they issue the occupancy permit well if they get a complaint they go in out and look at it is the way I understand yeah. it and then work with the landlord to come up with a solution to complaints but they they don't threaten to pull the occupancy permit um I don't know well, I guess that would be, I guess it's not on the top of the work list, but it, you know, we kind of find out into, yeah. why would we not be able to do that? You know, I know we're in the unincorporated areas and the cities take over, but if the cities wanted to adopt something like that or the smaller communities, mm -hmm. they might just go ahead and adopt whatever we came up with. Yeah. Well, we don't have a building code, so it'd be pretty hard mm -hmm. to come up with something. Okay. I mean, if you, Thank you. if you're interested in having a leaky roof, that's your right. Okay, that, that, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Okay. Okay. Um, so, notices of violations, we issued 27 in 2019. 20 of them were fa failure to maintain a maintenance contract. Those are for those fancy um, Advantex and, you know, non soil alternative mm -hmm. systems. They have to have a contract. And um, so, they get notices of violation if they don't. One pool violation, two nuisances, one well. Well went in without a permit and it went haywire on them. And then three septic installer errors. Um, so committee, boards and act, board, committee and board activities that we do. I'm on the board for the Iowa Onsite Wastewater Association. Um, and then I'm also on the Watershed Assessment Working Group. We're going to meet this week. That involves also some um, Squaw Creek snapshots, sampling at Harrington Park, Watershed Working Group meetings, and those are just the folks that are involved in that. Um, Matt goes to our MAPS meetings. Uh, Matt and Kathy and I uh, attend all the EOC meetings. Uh, I'm on the conceptual review team. And then Stephanie sat in on the mission statement committee. And then just a few highlights from the past year. We said farewell to Rewert's Well Company. He now is, um, his, his back is getting tired, number one. And number two, it's just hard to get employees for him. Isn't that interesting? And then he also dropped off his filing system, which we um, integrated into our um, digital. Foreign animal disease preparedness we're involved in. Um, fortunately, Keith emer of emergency management heads up the preparedness. Our involvement would be um, mapping capabilities, knowledge of where the wells are and waterways, um, knowledge and mapping of the manure management plans, 
assist with identifying carcass disposal sites, yuck, and um, assistance as needed. Longview Pork, we saw those three confinements go in this year. The wells were drilled, septic systems installed for the human waste, and they're underway. Interestingly, the wells were all around 400, 450 feet, quite deep for um, Story County. Average is 250. CAFO baseline water testing, we've been doing dabbling in water testing around them. Most of them are the field test kits, and then the lab is the BOD, E. coli, and ammonia. We, um, we contracted with Snyder to add a septic and well line on the beacon. Um, working out okay. It's taken us a while to populate those. Any new system going in automatically populates. So the old septic systems, as we go, we fill them in. Who's loading those right now? Is it your staff yes. as you get the time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Kind of as a system comes up, we're looking at it, we go ahead and fill in those numbers so that it connects. Yeah. Fernald, um, planning and development and environmental health have been working uh, quite a bit with Fernald. Um, so we did get, uh, so there's now three that were really bad news. Um, they're looking, they look like flat ground now. I could not find my picture, my most recent pictures, but they're looking good. Um, so what's coming up in Fernald, is there a, is there a house with um, no septic system? So working with them, not a lot of money to work with. And then um, all the other stuff with the guy on the corner and et cetera. So I won't go into that, but um, it, it does take a considerable a considerable amount of time um, working on complaints. They're just very time consuming, always have been, not just for Nald, all of them. Miscellany Ames Golf and Country Club were not happy with the way their system is, is working, their new system, so um, I think we're going to request that they add a holding tank and or a new um, unit, Advantex unit. Irons, there's still about seven or eight lots that are being developed. Um, not, not super happy with the way that all came down. Such a wet area, such a wet area. Iron Bridge, that's the one down that Ankeny uh, um, annexed. And um, that's going better than the irons, I'll say that. Uh, work with Nevada the fire, fire Department with on the nuisances and that wonderful write-up in the paper that was really appreciated. Uh, DOT well plugging compliance. DOT took the law under their own hands and um, we got DNR on our side and so we remedied the mistake that they made in plugging the well on the flyover area. Uh, let's see. I ISU, we put in two big fancy systems over in their ag area south of town. We've been doing a lot of mound troubleshooting, and then I've been working with Mike, not, not recently, but in, the, in 2019 on the Hickory Grove wastewater treatment stuff. Coming up, um, sorry, this is long, um, septic regulations and transitioning to the new procedures. And we really have to increase our outreach for new septic maintenance requirements. Cindy Hildebrand was at our meeting. She pointed that out, and she's absolutely right. Uh, tanning facility stuff, uh, passage. Pool regulation, Matt wants to see some changes on those, so we're working on those proposals. Uh, data management, we're working with IT to make sure that uh, our software uh, is um, supported by them, basically. Uh, data management, again, the beacon infilling, we're doing that. They're, tr they're draining the Crestview Lagoon, so that area just north of, um, so the Crane property north of Crestview that also owns that half south of the lagoon, that's being sold to Flummerfelt, so things are changing out there. Okay, and when did when did you get the latest, latest Date on that is the whole Crestview being sold? To no, sold that home? has not that has not sold yet. It's the Crane property and those little fingers that come okay. down into the into it, and then also the lagoon area, the part that that wasn't filled in uh -huh. is going to be sold. So that's going to cause some staging issues as far as when city's going to come out and and supply uh, sewer. Got it. So, but we're on top okay, of that. We're you. watching. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on them. Um, oh, 
for now, we're going to keep working on that. Mm -hmm. And then the other two things that recently came up is Fox Engineering is working on the um, Dotson Farms and uh, where the sewer, the um, where the uh, septics are going to go for those guys and then uh, Rock Creek down in Maxwell same story they're working on figuring okay. out where the septics go on that and this is my dog Sophie hey Sophie <laughs> so you said about the irons you weren't happy with how the septic systems had worked there it's the Advantix systems right well they are the Advantix and then they were having troubles with them and then they so then they switched over to peat systems so some of them so some of them are advantex and some of them are not peat cocoa cocoa now replaces the peats i'm it's just um we ran into a lot of easement problems the septics were were encroaching on easements that the city and the roads have put put up i mean it's just didn't pan out the way they had planned it. So it's not the systems themselves that's a problem, it's siting problems. S -I -D. That, and then also, it's <laughs> such a wet area that, you know, and this is true too of the Cameron Estates, you look at the, the aerial, there's just so much more water being added because of the septics being right there. Um, no way to avoid it. Um, hindsight, should have should have waited for the city veins to pop up there, but it's too late now. So we're going forward. But so we've got a lot more rural development that's going on. So this is something I'm hearing we should be thinking about more. Yes. When we are doing maybe the, the reviews. Yes. Because you know what I'm hearing is it's just too much of a concentration of water because of the individual septic systems mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in an area because it's such a concentrated residential area but they each got their own septic system mm -hmm. so rather than that's just water being brought so in we're not, we're, this isn't the end of this for us no uh -uh. at all i think that's something we need to think about right. in terms of planning and development and thinking you know maybe you and jerry talk about and do we need do we need to have a different approach out in the unincorporated areas of what we for the what subdivisions allowing. yeah yeah and I hear yeah. you're saying Dotson now Dotson may be different it's going to have some different drainage it's not as wet correct it is it's not as wet so, it is not as wet but but we're still adding all that water adding all that water mm -hmm. just right above Squaw Creek mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned but I have been mm -hmm. Margaret with the um, septic outreach you know the new ordinance yes. is there a way to on the beacon because i've got that slide up that we could have a link to the ordinance that so you've got you know so it would see that oh they've got a septic oh. system there but they could then click the link to see what the new ordinance is hmm i i don't know that's a good question for barb with it probably is that i is yeah, I'm doable? just wondering if there's just some way to do that that would just make it easier for folks mm -hmm. to see what that new oh, ordinance right is away. right away. Yeah. Okay. I'll look into that. Thank you. Any other questions? None. No. Nope. Been busy. Yeah. 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 It's been a good year. It's been a good year. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. She'll be looking for shades for all the dogs. Yes. That's right. Sue. Sue. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> sticking in here. No problem. What do you, you have a quarterly report. I have a quarterly report, yes. And I was supposed to do it a couple weeks ago, and then the creeping crud yeah. got a hold of me, and as it has so many other people, and... And we appreciate you stayed home and got well. well. <laughs> you know, to be honest, I don't know. I could have gotten too far for a couple of days. It was just awful. Yeah. <laughs> so you get these all the time, but I thought I would pass these your way. Oh, thank you. Just okay. Adam. Um. 
So just kind of numbers, October of 2019, we got 25 cats in, 24 adopted, one passed away naturally and one claimed. Um, dogs in were six, we adopted seven, we euthanized one because it was vicious and one was claimed. Um, and then we continued to have our menagerie of um, pigs, turtles, guinea pigs, rabbits, and we forgot our snake. And I can't believe we did that, but there is a snake on there too. Um, <laughs> November was 27 cats in, 18 adopted, two euthanized, and one claim. And this is really unusual because the fact that we got cat claims is just next to, we never get that. Yeah. So two months in a row, even getting one claimed was something. Um, we got eight dogs in, five adopted, one sent to a rescue, and three were claimed. And then we had adopted, as you can tell, some of the, we were down to one pig and two turtles at that point. Everything else had been adopted. In December, we got nine in. We had 33 adopted, so we played catch up finally. We had one euthanized. Um, dogs, 14 in, seven adopted, two claimed, and zero in. And we adopted two guinea pigs, which kind of set us in the right track. Our current population is, there's. 164 cats, so that number went down from the last time. We have 15 dogs and we have four um, rabbits, hedgehog, and again, I forgot the snake. I don't even know how I do that because he's just such a great, great guy. Uh, <laughs> volunteer hours in October were 270, November were 191, and December 205. In October, we had six after-hour calls. November, we had three. December, we had seven. Um, and this is usually rurally, but the cities also in their contract have the option to call us if needed for an emergency. Uh, so December was kind of an exciting month for us. You know how I am about raising revenue for our, our donation account. And we attended an adoption event over at the Eames Pet Co., which is our, they chose us as their adoption partner. And we took 10 cats that were available for adoption. They all got adopted and we got $50 per adoption. So we will be receiving $500 for that. Um, in December 14th, next weekend, we attended pictures with Santa and they could bring their animals in. We did 74 photos in our time period and we'll receive $10 for each one. So $740. Um, and again, thanks to Randy Markley who didn't really want to, but got talked into playing Santa and to Petco for inviting us into their fundraisers. There will be more of those coming up in the spring. Um, the one thing that you'll see there is a letter from the Ballard School. And this I chose this one because we consistently get donations from classrooms, Boy Scouts, Girl Scout groups. But this is something that we've been doing now for, I want to say, 16 years at Ballard every Christmas about the same time. And they collected a truck load of um, donations for us and some of them are in that picture and we also had many monetary and material donations made to us during the holiday season so uh, even though our cat numbers are finally seeing a decline um, everybody you know we always tell people kitten season isn't probably going to be here this year till yeah, May, June. Well, the other day we, we had a, a mom come in and had five babies over the weekend. So I guess there is no kitten season anymore. It's whenever it decides to happen. Um, we appre we appre received approval to continue with our dream of the livestock enclosure. And this project was funded by our large donation from Jeanette Williams and our friends of the animal donation account. Uh, Joby and I did visit with contractors yesterday uh, and we talked to a couple of them. Um, I was really surprised they are going to get workups made for bids in the next couple days and get them to us. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, well, gosh, you know, we could start this in March. So I was taken aback, providing I suppose that the weather is like it has been now. but. Yeah, so that could happen as soon as March, probably April for sure. So that was kind of nice to hear. Um, we are, so Dr. Carnavali, who is on Iowa State University shelter medicine team, um, she and a group of people, and we met with them, and then the day that, I don't know, it wasn't on the news, but I'm sure you heard about the day that Iowa State's alarms went off in the vet school. Mm -hmm. And we happened to, that was when our meeting was, so they kind of ushered everybody out to the, 
And we stood there and waited, and finally they just said to go home, we'd have another meeting. But the purpose of this will be as to be an outreach for people that maybe do have cats and dogs, especially cats, I think, will be the the really what we're trying to accomplish here and get them spayed for either free or reasonably so people can afford it. And this would be farm cats or people that just, you know, it's watching the cat accumulations over time and all of a sudden, wow, I didn't know I had 16 cats, you know. And so at least getting them fixed so that we're not reproducing. So they're working at that. There will be no cost to Story County for that. So that'll be nice. something that they're just gonna do. And at this point, it will be Story County Ames and I think Boone. So um, kind of a nice thing for the shelters in the area. Um, winter is slower, so we've been, we're trying to get the cages cleaned and ready. And by that, I mean, they get physically moved outside. So when we hear sun and 40 degrees in the forecast, we're pushing cages out and disinfecting them. We like to get all that done by that method with the disinfecting gun before we get into spring so that we kind of starting new with everything. Um, so that's something that we have been doing and will continue to do. We're anxiously awaiting our the per, be able to purchase our pop-ups or our um, stainless steel cages and get rid of our pop-ups. Those are just next to impossible to make sure you're getting clean. So that'll be mm -hmm. that'll be very exciting. Um, and we do loan out traps for people in the rural areas who need them for whatever to catch cat or whatever. And so we've been fixing those. Uh, not a lot of strays coming in, but this is how it is. This is that time of year. Um, we're still getting stuff in, but it's not coming in in the large amounts that we normally would get. And I'm guessing if the mild winter continues, it could be a heck of a, a year for cats and kittens um, because that's just kind of how the, the flow goes. Um, so we're kind of, I don't know if we're prepared yet, but we're kind of anticipating that that's what's gonna happen. So really, it, I, I can't tell you again what the remodel has meant to the shelter. We just had a guy in yesterday who hadn't seen it, and he walked in, he goes, wow, this is so great. And so uh, people do enjoy coming. Uh, we're having a thing for the Iowa State volunteers through the Students Helping Rescue Animals uh, on the 20, I think it's the 27th of February. And they're just gonna come after hours and we're gonna talk to them about stuff and more volunteer activities for people that really wanna be involved. And, um, you know, so it's made a huge difference. We can now have a lot more events. We will be doing a training probably again with Aaron Mignani Top, who does Top Canine Solutions, in probably April or May. And that will be at the shelter. And at this point, I'm kind of considering, depending on the topic that we choose, inviting the Ames and, and, and Boone Shelter over to see if they'd like to join us for that because Aaron offers a lot of good information. Cool. So other than that, it's just winter. And it's just, it just hasn't been as bad as some, but. <laughs> we've, no, we've all noticed it's winter. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. So, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. OK. And other reports, we have an unlisted. So we'll go to upcoming agenda items. And a reminder that agenda items are due tomorrow at 3 o'clock because Monday is a holiday. And does anybody have any agenda items for next week or not that coming on? Just we haven't already talked that. about? Okay. Public forum number two, um, even though I don't see any members <laughs> of the public here other than staff, I will just say it is, I'll open public forum number two. Anybody could come to the microphone? Seeing nobody move to the microphone, I'll close public forum number two. We'll go on to liaison assignments, committee meeting updates, and announcements from the supervisors. So, I don't know who wants to start. I think I went first last week. Okay, okay so I'm just looking at my calendar for this week. Um, tomorrow I have a meeting with the Story County Community Foundation in the morning. Um, we also have the, I believe we have the fair meeting, the Story County Fair meeting, um, and then the county assessor meeting tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Um, Yes, okay, then uh, Thursday, I've got on my calendar, I'm gonna try to attend the Slater, Slater Area Historical Luncheon. Um, and then I also uh, will be attending the NAACP uh, banquet that evening. 
Um, and then Friday, sorry, my my calendar just is uh, Friday. I have the DCAP meeting. They uh, changed it from last Friday to this particular Friday. Um, so I have that going on. Um, and then we're off. I shouldn't say off. The offices are closed on Monday um, due to uh, President's Day. Um, even though I have a community health meeting that morning that I'll be attending. So, um, so those are just some of the, my upcoming meetings. I do want to just reference that yesterday, Carla kind of mentioned it, we had our um, uh, children's advisory meeting yesterday. Um, we are, have identified or some folks that um, currently serve on the children's advisory committee who um, names are being put forth to serve on the governing board because um, we needed uh, folks of a family member, an educational representative, and then a provider um, to serve on the governing board um, as well. Um, we were also in need of having a pediatrician um, serving on the children's advisory board. Uh, and so recently retired, recently as of a year ago, Dr. Jack Swanson, who is a pediatrician at uh, McFarland, um, has agreed to um, serve on that Children's Advisory Committee. His name will formally be um, submitted to um, uh, the governing board for approval on that, but he came to our first meeting yesterday. I think he'll provide a wealth of knowledge. He, in his uh, 44 year of being a pediatrician, he had served on the National uh, Pediatrics Academy's um, mental health <laughs> work group. So he definitely has some knowledge base and insight and ideas um, that we're going to be needing for um, for working with children. Um, and then I also attended, this is an FYI, I attended the um, uh, juvenile justice meeting on Monday um, and had a presentation, um, uh, Nick Lenny was there um, and a colleague on the P3 campus, which is a um, anonymous reporting system um, utilized with for, for kids um, stuff. Really quite interesting on um, the volume of calls, how utilized it is. Um, uh, some of the questions surrounded, you know, are you getting kind of crank, I guess you'd say, type of um, reporting, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and really they are not seeing that at all. They are legitimate um, things that are being put out there. Um, and then they are, are being investigated by whomever is on the team. And that's kind of determined by each of the the districts, but that was really um, an interesting presentation. Okay, um, so tomorrow morning trustees meeting, I guess uh, township trustees, and we'll be attending that. It's actually put on by the auditor for the trustees, but uh, staff and supervisors and other elected officials are welcome to come and listen. Also then the fair board and the conference board. Thursday, I'm gonna be in Des Moines starting early in the morning for the regional 11 CEO and Central Iowa Workforce Development Board meeting. We'll be discussing the transformation and the 28E agreement. Um, I think all contracts need to be in place by June 30th. I think I've said that before. Then I'm headed over to Urbandale for the Herde Executive Board. Uh, the staff has uh, looked at a revised financial plan, including how to at least deal partially with the Dallas County situation. So the Executive Board is going over to preview that so that uh, we can ask any questions, get anything coordinated before we take it to the full board. Um, also, please Please know that we are changing the date of the employer open house. March 4th conflicts with a job fair in Boone. So I don't have an, a new date for you yet, but it seemed bad to ask all the employers to, to be over at Boone at a job fair and then jump right over to Ames to come to like a, a open house on transportation. Thursday night, I'll be at the Astoria County Farm Bureau board uh, meeting. Uh, and then Friday, um, I'm going to try and catch the presentation on the code UNESCO School Bond by Jim Walker that's going to be over in in uh, Colo in the library and then the 19th Amendment kickoff at ISU Memorial Union and just wanted to let you know that um, a, a person came in yesterday went to the auditor's office to inquire about some of the handout material that had come with the Colo UNESCO uh, School Bond and that had to do with 
uh, had questions about how the windmills produce um, income and how it produces for the school boards. They started with um, uh, Rhonda Sykes, then they came over to our office. Um, of course, nobody's giving out any particular numbers. When I when she started to ask me questions, I realized that she just didn't understand debt service. And so what was displayed, there were no discussion of real numbers. It was more explaining to her how debt service and general levy work, and then there is a pie chart. So I sent, uh, I scanned everything that she gave me, I gave it to Rhonda, I'll send it to you guys tonight in case somebody comes over. But that really seems to be the issue. People aren't understanding that the wind turbines provide both money for their general fund in the school district, but also then there would be an addition of a levy for debt service. And uh, it's just, it's a long, complicated explanation for the people who are looking at that bond. But just, I'll, I'll share that with you. And I'm done. Okay. Um, yesterday morning I attended the opioid task force meeting and they're doing some interesting planning for the upcoming year and one of the things we talked about was doing rural outreach and identified some issues and some possible partners in doing that. There will be more on that. Also attended an exit interview with the auditor's office the state auditor's office with our auditor's office staff and uh, the audit is nearly completed and um, it sounds like everybody's doing a very good job on that. I would, um, let's see, this afternoon, I have some meetings, uh, getting ready for the township trustees meeting tomorrow because uh, this, the sheriff's office is gonna be doing a, a um, presentation on StoryCom for the trustees Great. and giving the latest on that. And the fair board at three o'clock, conference, assessor's conference board as we've talked about, at 5.30, and I'll then rush over to a quarterly 911 service board meeting. So then Thursday, our watershed assessment uh, work group is going to meet, and I hope to, if we're done in time, I'll go over to Slater for Historical Society and also attending NAACP Freedom Fund. Friday, I will also be at the 19th Amendment, and that will kind of... I don't have anything right now for Monday. But I might go down to the legislature because there might be some issues coming up there. So that's what I that's what I've got going on. Anything else? No. Okay, then I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Hiddens? Aye. Olson. Aye. Merkin. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>